You're listening to Truth To You Radio with Jono on truthtoyou.org. That's truth number 230 dot org, where you can sign up for a weekly newsletter and also keep up to date via iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. And g'day. Boy, here's a list. Today to everybody listening in the, in the United States, of course, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Israel, United Kingdom, Philippines, Mexico, Brazil, Germany, Netherlands, Colombia, Argentina, India, Costa Rica, Spain, New Zealand, Norway, Venezuela, and France. You've got to be kidding boy. me. Wow. That's just some of them. What are you talking about? Hey, look, hey. We're, we're global. <laughs> we've gone we've gone worldwide. We're, we're entirely global. There's, there's listeners, listeners of truth to you all over the globe. And wherever you may be around the world, thank you for joining us once again, because it is time for Pearls from the Torah portion with Keith Johnson and Nehemia Gordon. G'day, gentlemen. G'day, Jono. This is Nehemia Gordon, the wandering Jew in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just, uh, I, I, listen, I want to say hello to everybody. You know, those in the United States, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to take, you know, take for granted those of you that are listening in the United States. I happen to be a real international guy. I love the idea of um, people around the world being able to click a button and listen to mm-hmm. us, and so especially to those around the world. And I want to take a moment, if I can. I want Nehemia, who's slipping, slip, swir- who's swir- slurping his coffee, slurping his coffee, <laughs> to take just a break uh, to to tell people about the whole iBooks issue, the way that we have a few different hey, things yeah. uh, that's available. Because I. I want him to give his piece first, then I'll give my piece. But uh, he's the one that really um, encouraged me on this. Uh, it's really it's, it's a technological uh, feat to get a book uh, put into uh, to, to iBooks. Uh, but Nehemia, tell him what's available okay. well, electronically. Well, let's start. Let's start with uh, truth to you, um, and you know, especially for us, the Torah pearls. But Jonah's got a whole bunch of programs, so you can you can actually subscribe for free. To truth to you on um, on uh, on iTunes, yeah. and what it, what it will do is it will download that onto your iTunes, and then when you sync your iPad or your iPhone or even your Android device, you'll then be able to listen to those podcasts uh, of Torah pearls, of mm-hmm. treasures from the Tanakh, of Light of the Prophets, and Cultured Care, all the other shows that Jono has. Um, but of course, the most important one, never forget, is Torah Pearls. And, uh, and so you can subscribe to that over on iTunes. Um, but what Keith is talking about is uh, if you're if you're into reading ebooks, and, and these days I I uh, try as much as possible to read um, ebooks because my eyes, uh, as I'm uh, pushing the old age of 40 soon, um, uh, my eyes are, are less and less uh, effective. And so what I love about about the ebooks is you can make the font as big as you want. At least I can do that on Kindle. Hey, nice. uh, so you can. You know any of the books that Keith and I have written, um, A Prayer to Our Father, uh, my book, The Hebrew Show versus the Greek Jesus, and Keith's book is Hallowed Name. They're all available in the um, in the in the iBooks format, which is something you can read on i uh, on, on the iPad, and you can actually read it on an iPhone, although it's kind of small. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but it's really comfortable for me on the iPad. And uh, you can also get it on uh, Kindle. Uh, I'm not sure, Keith, is your book available on Kindle? Does no, and I gotta tell, I gotta tell, really I, like I gotta tell him. I'll let you finish about Kindle, but, then I gotta tell my, him something. But my really books exciting. are available on Kindle: the the Hebrew show versus the Greek Jesus, a prayer to our Father. My new book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, is currently not available in an ebook format. Although perhaps by the time this program is broadcast, it will be. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. Although you know, but but you can get all the older books uh, on. Um, on the i in the iBooks format for iPad and also in the Kindle except for Keith's his held name revealed again. So, so, so I want to give a shout out. I want to give a shout out to my friend Michael Swamp who's over in hey, uh, Michael Swamp. Huntsville, Alabama. I don't know if he's listening or not, but folks, he roll did so tide. Amazing. Would you let me say what I have to say? <laughs> my thing, roll tide. I love that so, shirt. I wear it. So uh, my friend Michael uh, looks at the the book, uh, uh, his hallowed name revealed again. He didn't know any Hebrew. He didn't know any Hebrew letters. He didn't know anything. And he said, Keith, I'd like to put this on uh, iBooks. And I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. And and so he starts going through it. And literally this guy ends up picking up Jono, uh, all the letters of the Hebrew, all the vowels of the Hebrew. But what he did that was so amazing, he did this technological feat where he took the audio uh, that's in the back of the book. Those of you that have seen the book, mm-hmm. there's actually audio. 80 different Hebrew descriptions uh, according to you know to the Hebrew Bible mm-hmm. of the name Yehovah or the descriptions like El Elyon, the things we talked about throughout Torah, pours, uh, Torah pearls. But what he did was he was able to, to, to embed those things in the book so that if you're reading the book on iBooks, and here's what's exciting. So you see the name El Elyon, you push it, and then you hear my voice. It's like really cool. Really? And the other thing he really? did is he put the video of Nehemiah and myself as we were over in Israel, the video about uh, the Valley of Elah. 
around with David and Goliath. He put a bunch of technological like uh, bells and whistles mm -hmm. in the book. Now, here's what's exciting, Jonah, when you were reading the countries. Uh, this book now is in 26 different countries. The iBooks, iTunes stores in 26 different countries. So please go to iTunes, go to iBooks, and get this book. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's a few dollars. I don't even know what it is. But basically what I love about it is, even if you don't want to read it, the audio and the video <laughs> in it is worth it. <laughs> so uh, his Hollywood name, let the name be claimed. Amen. Amen. And people can also support your ministry, Jonah, can't they, by going to truth2letteru.org. Most certainly exactly. can. Most certainly can. There is a donations pa and donation page. You can click on that. And there's various ways that you can, uh, that you can give. And we really do very much appreciate your support. And that was a softball. You're supposed to hit it out of the park, Jonah. When I talk about international, international, <laughs> hint, 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 you're supposed to say, and I'm going to finally be leaving this this uh, this this rock called Australia, I'm, and I'm going to get on an airplane. And what are you going to do, Jonah? Jonah have am, you ever I'm, been outside of Australia? Yeah, you know, I have. I've toured around uh, uh, Europe, um, oh boy, probably 15 years ago. Uh, it's been a while, and I had to <laughs> had to get my passport again because it ran out. Wow. And yes. so, so you're I've you've done never that. Been on, to the U.S. You never been to America. I've never been to the U.S. The people and, in America uh, must bring you over to do the the Jonah Vandor Truth to You tour. Masa, oh, you're yeah, talking about oh, this hey. is our second leg of the tour after he goes to Israel. He's going to talk about <laughs> talk happen. about it, Jonah, and then we're going to bring you to the United States. <laughs> I've never been to the States. Uh, I've never been to Israel. And well, I've uh, never been to Australia, and, so we're, we're even. <laughs> I'm just saying, you'll be here one day. Just believe to me, Australia. You and I will be sitting, you know, with your, you 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 come here with your with your boomerang, and we'll um we'll sit on the Lachlan River and go fishing, my friend. Oh, that sounds so. Actually, it sounds kind of boring to be honest with you, but <laughs> fishing it's like watching grass grow. <laughs> anyway, but I am. I'm going to go to Israel for the first time. I'm really really excited, and it's funny that I'm talking about this now because Hani is over there as we speak, and uh, we're going to be speaking with her uh, in regards to what she's doing awesome. sometime very soon. Of course, all the listeners would have heard it by the time this is published. But I am going to Israel, and listeners who would like to come to Israel with, with Keith and myself, and uh, Nehemiah, you're going to be there, right? That's not muck around. Well, you're going to I'm going to right? be in Israel at the time that you guys are there. Um, uh, you're going to be busy looking at the grass, watching it grow, but... <laughs> the grass <laughs> yeah. Nice, Jono. <laughs> but, you, but we are going to hook up, right? Uh, I may make a cameo appearance on the T-Cube tour, the Time Tour, Tetragrammaton, Triple T tour. That's one. T, T to the third um, power. Now, a, you need to be T to the third power. You've got Jono and you've got Keith. <laughs> saying I'm the third T. What? <laughs> sure. That'll do. Sure you are. And, uh, and Yoel Ben Shlomo as well. And you're, and, you're, and you're Torah. <laughs> and I'm time. And I'm time. Yeah, there's the time. <laughs> it's on the right-hand side. On the, the Israeli flag on the right-hand side of truthtoyou.org, click on it. It will take you to the details. Do it fast because, goodness, by the time this is published – Keith, is there going to be space left on the on the coast? I, what? Not. I hope there isn't. But if there is, I certainly would. Anyone that's a, a Torah pearls person, a truth to you person, if there, if for some reason we don't have space, we'll kick Nehemiah off. <laughs> we'll so kick you kick him off the bus. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in all seriousness, everybody, I want to say something. I, I really do want to say something, and, and then we can really get started. Uh, I, you know, and I always do this, Jonah. I talk about you, and I talk about Nehemiah. But you know, I, I am I'm humbled by the fact that we're talking about this in such a casual way. You know, Nehemiah for years has been going over and um, doing something that is so crucial for us, those of us that are concerned about God's time and understanding it. You know, one of the things that he's done, and I could go into great detail about it, but I don't want him to get too much of the big head. But uh, he, 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 he's, he's really blazed a trail in being able to combine the two things that I think, based on the scriptures that we understand, the barley and the sighting of the new moon. I mean, this guy has made this his ministry. And when I say his ministry, I really mean his ministry. And so I've gotten to now two years in a row to actually go over to Israel and to, to follow him around and schlep around with him and – He's taken me to some very, let's just say, interesting places. But what's so powerful about it is to actually see with your own two eyes uh, the grass grow, as he says. It's so boring. <laughs> but to see the to see, to see the barley, well, no, this has, has been his ministry. Well, no, actually, watching finished. the grass grow is interesting. What well, fishing is no. is boring to me. Look, at least. No, when you go fishing with Jono, you go catching. You don't go fishing. We catch fish. We don't fish for fish, right, Jonah? We catch them. That's but the point is, is that uh, this is something that the way that this is working out, Nehemia will be there on a mission, doing what he's doing, looking for the barley. You know, we'll be there, and hopefully, at times, he'll come and eat dinner with us, or come over and share with us, and we we would would definitely would be excited about that. But we really want to uh, be supportive of what it is that he's doing because without that, we're kind of blind. At least I am over here in the United States on knowing 
the two most important things is the Barley Aviv and the Sighting Moon. So those that are going to be on the trip will get a chance to see some of that, and they will get a chance to be there for the sighting of the new moon. So you'll, it's going to be a pretty exciting time. It'll probably entice us to dangerous places, Keith. We better be careful. Today yeah, we are in Ha'azinu, Deuteronomy 32.1 to 32 verse 52. It's one whole chapter. This is the Song of Moses. Yes. Okay. So it starts with uh, 32 verse 1. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and ear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teachings drop as the rain, and my speech distill as the dew raindrops on the tender herbs and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of Jehovah, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all these ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Wow. Mm. This is awesome. Oh, man. Well, you know, we have to do something before we start. Before we, I, know we, I know we started at 32.1, and people have their wonderful little Bibles that say 32.1. But, of course, for me, Nehemi, I'm not sure what you have there. Jono, obviously, you, you have, I'm, sh- I'm thinking you have verse 30 at the end of the other chapter before we get to mm-hmm. 32.1. Do you not? Of course, of course. And, okay, and, and so, we, so I want us to read that verse because that verse obviously sets the stage for the words that are coming after. So could you just take a, a moment to read verse 30? Brilliant idea. And it does say by way of introduction, Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they mm-hmm. were ended. Okay, and so I wanted to ask the question, which was, you know, I want you to open up your English Bible, Jono, and take a look and see if you can see anything different with how the following words are laid out, the format of them actually on your page. I have them different here, and then I even want Nehemiah to look and see if it even looks, if he takes a a picture of his pages in the Hebrew Bible. I happen to have one here, so I know he can't get away with it, uh, to see if if the format actually looks different. So in your Australian Bible, is the format different, Jono? Uh, other, Other than being upside down. Of course. <laughs> and the format is certainly different. And you know what, format? Keith? It, it really does resemble the Psalms, actually. Oh, well, now you're talking. So it, it resembles it the Psalms. That's a great connection. And, of course, even in my NIV Bible, they've decided, yes, we're going to allow it to follow this idea that there's something different about the format. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail when we have our when we have our Nehemiah Gordon from the Hebrew University. He'll give us the technical aspects of it. But if I'm reading through this and I'm and I'm reading through it and I'm a person who knows nothing, if I'm just reading in my Bible, more than likely you're going to see a format change. And that format change is a hint. Even if you know nothing else, it's a hint. And what we know is uh, Moses says this. He recited the words of this song. And so when he actually says this song, I'm thinking, OK, so what does that mean? Different. We come to find out that this is a poetic uh, uh, form of writing that Moses is about to do, and when we know it's poetic, there are some different things that happen in the Hebrew. So, Nehemiah, I want you to give him just a little bit, if you can, a background about the difference between what we were just reading, the format change, and how does that change our, our interpretation of um, the song? Mm. Okay, well, all right. So, w- one of the things that you'll see in the, uh, and this is actually really exciting, that you know, the most important manuscript of of the Hebrew Bible is called the Aleppo Codex. Uh, but in, and it was held for centuries in Aleppo, Syria, and, and during the uh, anti-Jewish riots there in 1947, it disappeared, and it shows up 10 years later in Israel, but then when it shows up again in Israel, about a third of the book is missing. And uh, and so it actually only starts late in Deuteronomy, and then mm-hmm. you know, the rest of it is, we don't know where it is. And what's exciting is that we actually have the page for this section of Deuteronomy 32, and, mm-hmm. uh, and may, maybe Jonah can put this up, uh, you know, on the on the website. You can actually see very clearly. You don't have to know, be able to read a, a single letter of Hebrew, but you can see exactly where this poem begins, because the page is laid out differently than the other sections of Scripture. It actually divides each verse into two sections, and it's it's laid out in two columns, whereas in the other you have like this continuous flow. And actually, that's that that style-wise is is actually what's happening. That you have something called a uh, parallelism that's used uh, especially in Hebrew poetry where every single verse is divided into two and you can actually see that in the content so he starts off saying literally give ear uh, O heavens and I will speak and uh, uh, hear O earth and the words of my mouth or the utterances of my mouth and so the parallelism is essentially saying the same thing in two different ways sometimes it says the exact opposite so you have give ear and hear hear that's the same word as in Shema as in you know, hero Israel um, so give ear and hear means the same thing. And then he says, and I will speak And in the second half of the verse of the second half of the parallelism. He says the utterances of my mouth. So you've got, again, this uh, same thing, two different ways. I will speak and the utterances of my mouth. But then you have an opposite. You have heaven and earth. Those are the exact opposites. So you mm-hmm. have 
the same thing being said in two different ways, and sometimes the opposite is being said. And this is actually very important because sometimes we'll, we'll uh, you know, read a verse and not really understand everything it means in ancient Hebrew, but the fact that it's saying the same thing in, thing in two different ways, that's a clue for what it means. And, and I love verse 3 where it says, For the name of Yehovah I will call. Is that what it says in your English, by the way, Keith? Name of Yehovah Actually, I will call? Actually, it starts out, it says, uh, it says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Mm. Of the mm -hmm. Lord. And what name is that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell us. But whatever his name is, we'll proclaim it. In the Hebrew, it says, Kishem Yehovah Ekra, for I will call out the name of Yehovah. Mm. And then it says, Havu Godel Eloheinu, give greatness to our God. And there you have the exact parallelism. I will call and give greatness. How do you give greatness? By calling out his name. And that's interesting because, mm. you know, in this passage, we have God for the first time referred to as Father. And I believe it's the first time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people walk up to me and say, well, how can you speak God's name? You wouldn't call your father by his name. And, and my father actually taught me a really interesting lesson about this. My father who passed away last year, blessed memory. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, it's only disrespectful to call a father by his first name if he doesn't let you. But if he gives you permission to, then in, in Jewish tradition, it's not considered anything negative. Um, and uh, it's actually considered, you know, honorable to call people by their first name if they allow you to call them and our heavenly father definitely has a, given us permission to call him by his first name mm. and that's what moses is saying here for the name of jehovah i will call give greatness to our god we give greatness to him by calling out his name it's not disrespectful it's honorable to do that to him but there again you see the parallelism i will call out give greatness name of jehovah our god uh it's saying essentially the same thing in two different ways sure. mm -hmm. So one of the things I, that I, I was, I, you know, I was looking forward to this, guys, because, uh, you know, we we were talking uh, earlier and we were building up to it, and I'm still surprised that Nehemiah hasn't uh, hasn't brought this out. But uh, Nehemiah, um, I want you to, I can't believe I'm letting him talk again. I, I don't just, I, I'm going to feel bad about this later. But Nehemiah, I don't want to take this away from you because I think it's something that we built up toward, uh -huh. which had to do with the fact that um, this is something that Moses actually brought before the people and. In a mm -hmm. sense, as we talked about it, it was something that he would he expected that they would memorize, something that oh, they yeah. would actually. That actually, it's, it says that yeah. in, the, in the earlier chapter. Exactly, and, but and, I want to. I want to. And it actually makes you know, if you think about it, uh, one of the things that uh, you know that that people have found is that it's much easier to memorize things if it's a song. Have you mm -hmm. ever thought about that? Like songs, I remember jingles from the 1980s, <laughs> from uh, you know, from when before I moved to Israel. You know, uh, stupid little jingles, you know, what, 800, uh, no, no, empire, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and I can't even sing, I'm tone deaf. And, and so Moses, yeah. wanting the people to memorize this, he, he presented it as a song, or, or God presented it through Moses as a song, and, uh, and it talks about that in the previous chapter, that they were to memorize this. And um, and why do they need to memorize it? Because this is because you know a lot of the people were illiterate, and even if they could read, they didn't have access to books. Mm -hmm. So basically, he's saying, okay, here's the core principles, the things that you need to remember, um, the things that you need to remind yourself constantly of. Those you know you can't you're not going to wait every seven years for this. This you need to know always. And and so really, in some sense, Deuteronomy 32 is is. I would say one of the one of the I don't know seventeen most important passages in the Bible. That's nineteen, um, or, or, or is that twenty-two? We're up to twenty-two. <laughs> oh, we have twenty-two. <laughs> twenty-two. So one of the twenty-two most important passages in the Bible, yeah. because it's something that the Israelites had to memorize. And uh, and let's look at that passage in the previous chapter, in Deuteronomy thirty-one. Because I was going to say, while you're looking for that very yeah. quickly, Nehemiah, Jono, I want you to, I want to ask you a question, Jono, when he gets to it, whether or not you would interpret this verse that he's about to bring as something that you would see as this would be a, a call to memorize, or in your English Bible, might it be something different? So I want us to go to that verse. Uh, is verse, that verse not, 21. Is it verse 21? Then it shall be, when many <laughs> evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in their mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their behavior today and, uh, and so on and so forth. Actually, verse 19 also in the Hebrew says that. Can you read verse 19? Mm. 19 says, Now therefore, write down this song for yourselves. Oh, and teach it to your children. Teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And it's really interesting. Here, here's a great example of how idioms vary from language to language. And, and by idioms, I mean like, you know, figures of speech. Like, you know, I love the example, dead as a doornail. Say that in another language, it makes no sense. Probably even an Australian. Um, but uh, 
you know, uh, so here's an example of an idiom that doesn't translate. So in English, when we want to know something, uh, we want to know something without by memory. We we say we know it by heart, mm-hmm. right? We know it by heart. In mm-hmm. Hebrew, you say you know it by mouth. And when he says, and actually, we, to put it in their mouth means have them memorize it. That's what that means mm-hmm. in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Teach well, let me it to say the this: uh, throw and place it in their mouth. Keith. Here, now, I, I want to be controversial here. If it's if it's okay, uh-huh. if it's not, it doesn't matter. We've only got one more left. Uh, so, so I'm imagining I'm imagining uh, uh, you know, well, Rabbi Gordon, process. who I met, and 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 I, and I and I, I, you know, it really is it is amazing, Nehemia, to to be on the radio with you and to know that uh, I've had a chance to uh, to sit down with your father, to eat with him, to to hear him, and and he was a he was really a wonderful man and. Um, uh, but I want to I want to imagine him hearing this verse, and then and and I want to give him to the NIV if I can, Jono. Mm. It says, "Now write down for yourselves this song and teach it to the Israelites." And here it comes now. Have them sing it so that what? it may be a witness. For, no, I'm telling you what it says. So I'm no, imagining that. Gordon, you're, you're no, I'm telling you what me. it says. I'm listening to what I'm what? saying now. It says, have them now write sing it. Down, it. Write it down for well, yourselves. They probably did sing song, it, but and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. So if Rabbi Gordon would have ever like let me sit down and open up my NIV because you know I I talked to him several times Jono and and I I, I get, came at him at all sorts of different angles but if I would have brought this verse and he would have said very well I'll teach my son to sing it he would stop and say but wait if I do that that would be a real problem because if I were to teach my son to sing this song it would never be sung again ladies and gentlemen I want you to listen. <laughs> We must pray, Jono, that Nehemiah never tries to sing this song. <laughs> I've been practicing for weeks. Oh, wait. wait I won't do all 43 verses. Now, let me just say something. Here's something that's amazing. If we have him sing a song in English... He I know, this is it. what I was going no, to no, say. No, if we have him sing a song in English, it's... No, it's but if it's... we have him sing a song in English, he destroys it. But in Hebrew, yeah. no, he sounded pretty darn good. Now, here, before this, I'm telling everybody, I want you to... <laughs> my favorite song, my favorite song is Amazing Grace. In the oh, don't oh, sound even... Man. Uh, and, <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, it sounded no, no, great no, no, in the no. show this morning. I don't no, see no, the listen. problem. Here's the point. I'll never... Listen to the song again. Destroyed when he did it in Hebrew, when he did it in Hebrew, it actually sounded pretty darn good. So, anyway, I just wanted to go to that. Now we can go back to thirty-two. Yes. Okay. All right. So again, it says in, in verse four that he is our rock. We're going to talk about the fact that he is our rock a little later on because that's a theme that keeps reoccurring in this chapter. Verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with Yehovah, of foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father? Come on with that. Who bought you? Is he not your father who bought you? Now, this is, as you mentioned, uh, Nehemiah, um, potentially the first verse um, of, that I'm aware of, anyhow, that uh, refers to Yehovah as father. And that's another uh, um, uh, focus later in, the, uh, in this chapter as well. Has he not made you and established you, it says? Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I wanted to. I, I know. I know we're we're doing this a little bit different, but there is a, a phrase, a very a very important phrase in in thirty two. So if I if I read my uh, English Bible and it says here, he is a faithful God, is what it says in thirty two. Mm-hmm. Just before we get to that, but in in Hebrew, uh-huh. when I read it, it yeah. says El Emuna, Emuna. So so here's this. You know, when I when I see that, when I'm looking at El Emuna, and then I'm looking at uh, a faithful God, I'm thinking to myself, wow. When I when I have these descriptions and I and I speak them, it's kind of like Chemia re- singing in English and then singing in Hebrew. It's two different things completely. So when I'm reading it in English and I say he's a faithful God, I kind of go real quick past it. But when I read it in Hebrew and it says El Amuna, I stop and think, okay, so what does that mean? And I know this word Amuna happens to be a word that the root of it is the way we say on this show quite a bit, Amen. Mm-hmm. So what does uh-huh. that, you know, you know, in other words, if I read that casually, if I look real casual, a faithful God who does no wrong, but then I stop and say, El Amunah, 
this is what he is. This is who he is. This is a this is a description. A description. It's it's a it's a statement of what he's what his. How can I how can I say this? Uh, he he's full of faithfulness. Um, it's that you know like you say this this issue uh, a faithful God, but it's like he's full of this is this is who he is. His faithfulness is a part of you know when we when we talk about him and and the mm-hmm. description of what he does and who he is. Um, this is this is it. So this I mean, is, it made, this is this is the second. Stop. This is the second part of verse 4, Keith? Yes. So in, in mine, I've got a God of truth without injustice, righteous and upright is he. You've got a, so a, a they, God so of So they translate it as truth, what? basically is what you're saying. Yeah. So the word is emunah, and emunah is the word. This is the normal word that we translate as faith. Whenever we mm. talk about faith and you look back in the, in the Hebrew Bible, this is the word emunah. And there's actually a famous verse, one of my favorite verses, um, and, and, and we could talk for a whole 45 minutes on this, and, and I might just do that. Um, <laughs> but no, one of my favorite verses is the, Habak- uh, the book of Habakkuk, or what do you guys mm-hmm. call that in English? Habakkuk? Habakkuk? Habakkuk. Yep. I'm back. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, um, one of the lesser read prophets, it says, which uh, if you translate literally means a righteous man will live by his emunah, by his mm-hmm. faith. And uh, when you talk about faith in the Tanakh, faith really means faithfulness. It means um, reliability. Mm-hmm. And I love this example of the word emunah, which appears uh, uh, here. It's in, um, hold on. It's in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 7. And it's talking about these people who are doing the repairs in the temple. And it says, how, uh, it says uh, however, there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hands because they dealt faithfully. And the word there is emunah. And what that means is they dealt in faith. And what that meant is, is these people were reliable. They were consistent. They were truthful. They were honest. And, and really, emunah implies all of those things. It's, and that's why we can say amen, which literally means truth. But we could also talk about emunah, meaning faith. It's all from the same root because it's, it's really faithfulness. Fa- yeah, I have trouble saying that word. Faithfulness and uh, consistency. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting because what's the context of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse uh, 3, uh, verse 4, rather? Let me read the verse before it, which is, I know in Judaism, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. didn't say it was the most important, but it's one of the most famous. So it says in chapter 2, verse 3 of Habakkuk, it says, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. Say appointed time. Appointed time. Appointed. And hasteth towards the end and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not delay. And the reason this is uh, such a famous verse, and if you look in the original context, it's talking about the coming of King Nebuchadnezzar, who will destroy the temple. Mm -hmm. But Jews have taken this verse and say, okay, that vision was something that was for a time in the future. And now bear in mind, Habakkuk was speaking before Nebuchadnezzar. And he was saying, this thing might take a long time to happen, but there's an appointed time that God has established, and wait for it, even though it may tarry. It will come when it's time for it to come. It's not going to delay. And so uh, historically, Jews have taken this verse and said, okay, what was true for Nebuchadnezzar is also true for the Messiah. The Messiah will come. Of course, Christians say come back, but the Messiah will come or come back. And when it's his time, wait for it. It, Though it may tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not delay. And in fact, this is a song I grew up singing um, about the coming of the Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah based on this verse. Uh, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not delay. And then it talks out, it says, but the, uh, behold, his soul is puffed up, talking about Nebuchadnezzar. It is not upright in him, but the righteous shall live by faith, shall live by faithfulness, shall live by truth, shall live by reliability and integrity. Now, John, now Jono, and, I'm going to have him, I'm going to have him slow down here because this is very important for us in our conversation. Because so uh, we've got to have our faith, our emunah. Yeah, and and so uh, Jono, I want to ask you this: you're, you're a seminary guy. You're a guy that's gone through mm-hmm. theological, biblical training, etc. When you hear Nehemiah quote, "The righteous will live by faith," what's the first verse you think about? Well, Cook two four, no. What's <laughs> he's talking about? When, I'm, I'm, when you hear that, what's what, what's? Well, let me let me confess. When I hear you say the righteous will live by faith, uh, the first thing I think about is the New Testament. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think about the, uh, you know, the, the very first association that went through my my mind as soon as he said that was New Testament. There it is. And so what I, the reason I wanted to say this, and I, this is something that, that by the time people hear this this uh, this program, Nehemiah and I will have been through quite a bit of controversy because one of the things that's been happening, um, and by the time you guys hear this, is hopefully we're we're still traveling together. Uh, there are some people that are really not liking this idea of a, of a Karaite and a Methodist, a Jew and a Gentile, 
getting on stage together, preaching together, teaching together, sharing together, because what possible connection could I, as the enlightened Methodist that I am, be with this, uh, you know, have with this, this Jewish man who's, who's, whose eyes are closed? How could we possibly minister together? And so we've asked this question over the last couple months uh, about what does it mean for a Jew and a Gentile that's not a Jew that's not, quote unquote, messianic and a Methodist who doesn't sometimes know where he is. But what does it mean for us together to go and to open the word of God and to share it with people? Well, one of the things that they would say is, well, you, you, don't, you don't have the faith of the New Testament. And here, Nehemiah just casually is sharing about, uh, and I, I brought this up to, to make it as a softball, Jono, uh, El Emunah, mm -hmm. this God of faithfulness, you know, a faithful God. And of course, for you, it uses the word truth. So by the way, Jono, we are starting a new radio program called Amen to You Radio. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be, be your competitor, own, Jono. We're going to be your competitor. <laughs> we're going to be doing our own radio show because what we're happens is going to edit the audio, though. No, you, we want to invite you on it. The only thing is oh, cool. we're, I'm okay. going to be in charge of the recording so we never lose a recording. But look, <laughs> let me just <laughs> – <laughs> let, let, let me say this. So, so one of the, the reasons people don't this know is, so is we've had to like redo four episodes because we've, <laughs> had, to, we've had to do episodes. But let me say, let me bring this up, Jono. So, one of the things that's happened is the reason that I asked the question, "Can I ever minister with this guy?" is because Nehemiah has gotten me kicked off a radio program. The radio uh -oh. program was going to have ha have us on, and then some people around the radio program said, "No, we won't. We won't have Nehemiah for two reasons." One, he, he, he keeps talking about this, this Hebrew manuscript that has a pro proclamation of a name that doesn't match with our tradition. Two, he's not a believer. And so – and that's, I'm just going to say the bottom line is it's, it was, it was anti-Semitic. But the point was they said, you know, Keith, you could come on, uh, but, but not Nehemiah. And so my point is, well, I'm not going to go if I can't go with Nehemiah because the point is, based on what he just said, he has faith. The, the faith that we're talking about in the New Testament – bases itself from an understanding of faith. Paul himself quoted the verse that you just talked about, Nehemiah. And, and the point is, where did, what is the basis of that faith? Back to Deuteronomy 32, he's El Emunah. He's a God of faith. And if you want to say faithfulness, mm -hmm. faith, he's, he's full of faith. And so, I mean, I just had to bring that up because it, I think sometimes right. we tend to think faith only starts in Matthew and never was at all talked about. And so here we're in Deuteronomy talking about it. So, yeah. so it's uh, it's Second Corinthians five seven. There it is. Uh, it says walk by faith. So hey, can mm -hmm. I can I for, a few things? All right. So one thing it's interesting. You say Keith that I mean, he's not a believer, couldn't be on the radio show. If you say to any Jew, any Jew is not messianic, meaning any like you know normal Jew, mm. say uh, I say um, I'm not a believer. What they hear is you're an atheist. It would never uh -oh. occur to like a regular Jew if, if you say you're a believer that it means you believe in Jesus or you believe in Yeshua. Believer means I believe in God, mm. and uh, you know. And I've actually had this conversation um, with 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 some Jews uh, trying to <laughs> explain to them the whole messianic and, and Christian mindset, and uh, you know, and like like for example, one time I you know I was disinvited from a place and I explained that to a friend and they, and they said, well, why why didn't they want you? And I said, because I'm not a believer. And he said, but I thought you did believe in God. And I'm like, well, no, no, I'm I'm a believer in in the Jewish faith, mm. um, in the faith uh, that De that Moses is talking about in Deuteronomy 32. I believe that faith. I'm a hundred percent believer. Um, and you know, and, <laughs> and so I had to explain to them that in Christianese, believer means um, uh, you know, believer, I guess, in Jesus and the whole New Testament thing. But mm. hey, speaking of the New Testament, um, actually, before we get to the New Testament, this verse that we quoted in Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. Uh, the righteous shall live by his faith. Is uh, it's interesting because this is a verse that's been perverted by um, by one of the founders of modern Israel, whose name was David Ben Gurion, and he was a great man who did a lot of good things. But he also perverted this verse, and the way he did it is he changed the words very slightly, so subtly that unless you were a Bible scholar or you know sitting reading it, you, you might miss it. And uh, so the verse says tzaddik, say tzaddik, tzaddik means a righteous tzaddik. man. Tzaddik be'emunato yichye, a righteous man shall live by his righteousness, by his, uh, by his faith. And what he did is he changed it to ish be'emunato yichye, and then he added another word, ish, twice. He said ish ish be'emunato yichye, which in modern, he actually in biblical Hebrew as well, means each man shall live by his faith. And uh, he Subtle. turned it. And he, so basically what he turned that into is from saying a righteous man shall live by his emunah, by his faithfulness, to each man will live by his faith. And that became – Are you trying to say that was intentional, Nehemiah? No, I'm saying that David Ben-Gurion did that very intentionally and deliberately. And this is something Israelis will quote left and right. Each man will live by his faith, which means 
You can be a Buddhist. That's fine. You can be, uh, you can be, uh, you know, a Muslim. That's just fine. And and they think they're quoting the Bible. That's the problem. They think they're quoting the Bible. The phrase "each man will live by his faith," but what it says is the righteous will live by his faith. So if you're unrighteous, your faith is completely w- worthless. Mm. And um, and and I think this is what uh, going back to the New Testament. Um, you know, you guys say this is quoted there, so I just looked this up, and I see I find it in three places: Romans one seventeen, right. Galatians three eleven. And look, I'm not very smart. This was a computer search. Uh, <laughs> Romans one seventeen, Galatians three eleven, and Hebrews ten thirty eight. And Hebrews ten thirty eight is actually quoting the original passage in Habakkuk. It right. says, "For yet a very little while, he that cometh shall come." And obviously, it's not, not Nebuchadnezzar, delay. and shall not tarry, not delay. But my righteous uh, one shall live by faith, and if shr- he shrink back, my soul has no pleasure in him. What does that mean, if, my sh- if he shrink back, my soul has no pleasure in him? Uh, it's the exact opposite of what David Ben-Gurion said. Each man shall live by his faith. No, the righteous shall live by his faith. If he turns to sin, that faith is not faith. It's, uh, it, it, it's a perversion of faith. And uh, Romans one seventeen. Well, I'm gonna let, let Jonah read Romans one seventeen. Well, that's, that's, it's interesting because it says, "For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just the just shall live by faith." And, and, and there, it there it's quoting Habakkuk. But uh, the the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Keith, look, he told you to read that verse. Not <laughs> if we're if we're, we're going to do if we're going to do uh, justice to this passage. If we're going to be faithful. We really got to read the entire context. Do we re- not? And I'm, I'm asking. Do we want to do a whole show on Romans? Look, I'm <laughs> trying to go to back to Deuteronomy Maybe, 32. Okay. No, no. Look, I, no, no, no. Well, so I've got. A, I've, I've so even got a subheading. I've got a subheading up. above 16, and it's uh, the just live by faith is the is the subheading, and it says, uh-huh. "For I am not ashamed, I am not ashamed uh-huh. of the gospel of Christ." He says, "For it is the power of God to salvation oh, everyone, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek." For uh, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So what I propose is that we save the, the uh, uh, explanation and interpretation of this verse for uh, Torah Pearls Part 4, <laughs> after we've done the Torah, <laughs> after we've done the prophets. Maybe we'll do the writings after that, and then uh, we save that for a future uh, cycle. Because really, we could talk for an hour on Romans one seventeen. Can I get an amen, uh, Keith Johnson? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So, 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 maybe so what, I, what I will to... challenge the people to do is to go read Habakkuk chapter two in its context, read Romans one in its context, read Hebrews ten in its context, and then Galatians three verse eleven. Now that no man is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous shall live by faith. And by the way, this is something I think every Jew would agree with that you don't come before in God. And you say, oh, I kept this commandment and that commandment and this other commandment, but I'm not righteous. <laughs> mm, <laughs> I've lied and cheated the deal, but I've got all my brownie points in. So I, I'm justified by the law. No, you live by righteousness, by, by excuse me, yes. by faith, which is faithfulness, which isn't just, you know, I, I did a, you know, uh, this, this and that. Faithfulness is this consistency. This is I'm sticking with God. And people could read Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33 and get more information on that. We really should get back to the Torah portion. Uh, yes. <laughs> can, I, can I talk about verse 4, which you guys skipped over so conveniently, Go where it says, says about our rock. Oh, no, actually, we're talking about that. El Emunah, he's a faithful God. Ve'en Avel, Sadiq v'yashar hu. Sadiq, he's a Sadiq. He's righteous. Mm, now, right. Can you imagine if he said about God, well, he believes. He doesn't actually follow his own instructions of love, but he believes. No. <laughs> righteous is, uh, he's righteous and he is yashar. He has integrity. And it says Ve'en Avel, and there is no. How do you have translation of that in yours, uh, uh, Keith? Who does no wrong? Does no wrong. What do you got? I got for he is perfect. He is perfect. Okay. Mm. A God of so, truth and without injustice. Right, without injustice. That's the, that's okay. the translation that's the of Ein Avel. Um, and then I, I want to quote a verse in uh, Isaiah forty-five, verse seven. This is one mm-hmm. of my favorite verses, and we talk about this in the book of prayer to our Father. And the context there, remember, context is important. Context, context, context. Mm. The context there is that God is actually speaking to uh, to Cyrus. He he's ta- he mentions Cyrus by name mm-hmm. uh, as the king of Persia, and he calls him a Mashiach, an anointed one. Amen. And um, meaning God has anointed Cyrus as king. And he says, even though you did not know me, meaning Cyrus wasn't a <laughs> Cyrus wasn't a believer. Mm. Cyrus had his own beliefs, and he was not he legitimately was not a believer. He was a Zoroastrian believer. Mm-hmm. And the Zoroastrians believed in two gods. There was a good god and a bad god. The good god, Ahura Mazda, was the source of all good in the universe. And uh, Ingram Ainu was the source of all evil in the universe. He was called the evil one. 
And so God speaking to his Messiah who doesn't know him, um, not that he's the Messiah, he was a Messiah. We're waiting for a different one. Isaiah 45, 7, it says about God, it says he who creates, uh, actually you read it in your translation, Jonah, 45, 7 of Isaiah. 45, 7, it says... He who forms light or something. For like I, uh, I am Jehovah. There is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, <laughs> Jehovah, do all these things. Oh, it doesn't say. It doesn't say create. It calamity. says calamity. It's... Come on, what are, you, what are you talking about? What do you got there, Keith? Create Forty-five calamity. verse seven. One second. Forty-five verse seven is. I love it when they do this. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. Disaster. You guys are just trying to mess with me, right? Here's what it says in Hebrew. He who forms the light and creates darkness, he who makes peace and creates evil. The Hebrew actually says, Borera, he who creates evil. I, Yehovah, do all these things. Now, some people have the spirit of Zoroastrianism, and they say, nope, he's the good God. There's no evil that comes from him. All the evil comes from the evil one. From mm -hmm. And they'll throw in the word Satan there, but they're really talking about Ayngramanyu, the, the Zoroastrian mm -hmm. evil one. And, uh, and that's not the God of the Hebrew Scriptures. What God said to Cyrus the Zoroastrian, a message for all time, for the Zoroastrians of today, for the spirit of Zoroaster, which is still among us, Yehovah is the one who creates good and he creates evil. Now, that's important for us to know. He is the source of all thing. Now, having said that, we've got to remember what it says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, that there is no avel. There is no, and avel really you could translate as perversion, uh, or but really in the sense of iniquitous perversion. Mm -hmm. uh, so he creates evil, but then he gives us the freedom of choice whether to do good and, or to do good. Uh, or to do evil, and, uh, and let's not get into the whole issue of Satan. Don't you have like a program on that, Jonah, with uh, Ira Michelson? Treasures uh, from the Tanakh. Uh, Ira and I have been working through the Book of Job, and we did touch on all of those cool. topics. Okay. Yeah. So they could re they could listen to your program to hear about Satan and the Tanakh, Satan. Mm -hmm. um, but look, my understanding of Satan is he is out there. He's going to and fro in the earth, and he's causing trouble. But who gives him the permission to do that? Yehovah, and Yehovah is the Amen. one who creates evil. That doesn't make him an evil god. He is a righteous god. He's a god of truth and integrity and without any iniquity, but evil in the universe doesn't come from some uh, demonic force. All the Everything in the universe comes from him. It's all ah, from him. Ah, now it's, you mentioned a word. We're going to be coming back to that, uh, demonic forces. It is. Mm -hmm. it's, going to, it's coming up in a few more verses. So uh, conversely, he then talks about Israel. They have corrupted themselves and, and so on and so forth in verse 5, uh, as opposed to the, the righteousness and the, and the faithfulness and the justice of God. And, uh, and, and as I said in verse 6, there's the mention of him being our father. And just a reminder to everybody who doesn't know, a prayer to our father, the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer, Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson, a brilliant book. If you haven't got a copy of this, you're way behind people. Got to yes. catch up. And by the way, let me say this. Yep. To those who haven't gotten the book, I want you to do us a favor. And this is a serious request. I want you to go to a aprayertoourfather.com. Get the book right there. And also, if you notice on the front, there's two little pandas bears. There's one that looks a little different than the other one. The cuter the one, one is me. <laughs> No. Yeah, right. And, He's uh, a little and, runty and, one. <laughs> yeah, and, and anyway, the, the, that's an opportunity for people to join us because we are going to China to bring this wonderful message uh, from the Book of Prayer of our Father, oh. Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer, and some other things, mm -hmm. very important things to the people of China. And, and that is – and we're, we're in conversations today. today. The trip is getting uh, bigger. There's more opportunities. Things that are happening are really exciting. And for those that have already uh, come alongside, we're extremely – thankful to you for those that have already given and those that would be willing to pray do me a favor get the book read the book and then come back and see if that book is something that uh, has a message for the world and see if china wouldn't be a good place to bring it and if you believe that then support us as we go because we are taking a step of faith so mm. and for those who don't know that book has actually been translated into chinese a prayer to our father and hebrew yeshua versus the greek jesus have both been translated to chinese mm -hmm. and they're being made available to the chinese people and it's actually very difficult to get a book about anything to do with faith into into main, into um, mainland China, but those two books have been put out by the uh, China Alliance Press, 
which is actually authorized by the Chinese government to distribute books in China. And so this is actually a, you know, a real blessing that nothing mm. like this has ever come out before in Chinese. And no. uh, I'm not sure anything has come out in English like that, but uh, <laughs> definitely not in Chinese. And um, you know, it's really exciting that we're going to have the opportunity. Uh, um, well, so far we've got enough for my ticket for the record, and we're still working on Keith's ticket. So go and give to the little <laughs> rented panda, or that little panda is going to get left behind. Or, yeah. So there is a, a widget uh, on creatorelfather.com. You'll also find it on Truth to You on the right hand side. Uh, well worth contributing to my friends and like I said if you haven't got the book it is a brilliant book I highly recommend it go to the website and buy the book now uh, verse 7 remember the days of old consider the years of many generations ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you when the most high divided the inheritance to the nations when he separated the sons of Adam he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel for the for Jehovah's yeah. portion is his people, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Okay, we got to stop here because this is, you know, you might think this is, you know, not important, but this is actually a very important verse. Um, <clears throat> 23. Uh, 23? Go ahead. Yeah, this is the 23rd <laughs> most important verse in the Bible. Oh, I, I didn't say it was one of the most important. <laughs> oh, sorry, verses. sorry, sorry. Take that off a the list. very important verse. Say A. Any very important verse. I wouldn't put it in the top 50, to be honest with you. But okay. what makes it important is what people try to do with it. That's what makes it important. So it literally says in Hebrew, when the Most High uh, uh, divided up the nations, or mm -hmm. yeah, divided up the nations, when, or when he literally gave the nations as inheritance, when he uh, s separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel or the children of Israel. Now, what does that mean, according to the number of the children of Israel? And if you ask, um, look at you know historical Jewish sources, what they'll say is, is go over, and I think we talked about this when we did Genesis 10. So if you read Genesis 10, it lists all the nations after the flood, and if you count them, there are actually 70 nations. There's actually 73, including Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three sons of Noah, but they were born before the flood, so the ones born after the flood is 70. And it says there, from these were divided out, you know, separated out the nations. So there were originally, after the flood, 70 nations that were born in, in essentially 70 languages at one time, 70 uh, mother languages, <clears throat> which then have separated into lots of other languages, obviously, like, you know, you've got Latin, which became uh, French and Spanish and Romanian, etc. But originally, there were 70 nations with 70 different languages at the Tower of Babel. Um, and that God scattered throughout the earth, and so when it said, and what, and what does that have to do with the number of the sons of Israel, the children of Israel? That when the children of Israel went down to Egypt, it tells us repeatedly. It says several times that there were seventy, so seventy nations, seventy Israelites that went down to Egypt. This is actually, and it's very common in poetry to have little um, allusions like this, little um, kind of coded references. So this is almost like a riddle. Okay, he set out the borders of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. If you hadn't read Genesis and you hadn't read Exodus. You would have no idea what he's talking about. But right. since we know that, we understand it. Now, what happened is uh, – and remember, this is for the people who don't have the Bible next to their bedside. They hear it once every seven years in the public reading, mm -hmm. and these are the points he wants them to remember and, and, uh, and to know by heart uh, um, and to constantly remember. Um, so uh, what's interesting about this is they found a Dead Sea Scroll, and the Dead Sea Scroll, according to the scholars, uh, has a different reading. It says in the Dead Sea Scroll – uh, supposedly, it says when the Most High uh, uh, divided the, or gave the nations inheritance and divided the sons of men, uh, he set the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Yep, that's what that's what they say, mm -hmm. and uh, this is four Q Deuteronomy J supposedly. Now I remember back in the 1990s I was at Hebrew University and one of the pr professors presented this and what, what the importance of this is that this matched a reading uh, from our Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. Um, it has a difference with the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible. You know, a lot of people say, oh, that's the oldest Bible, the Greek Bible, because it was translated in 250 B.C. And actually what they don't realize is only the five books of Moses, the Torah, was translated in 250 B.C. And the one we have today is from 500 years later, 550 years later, from 300 A.D. So we don't have the original from five, three, 250 B.C. But anyway, the Septuagint, the Greek, ancient Greek translation of the Bible, says something different. Instead of according to the number of the sons of Israel, it says according to the number of the angels of God. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind what the Septuagint says, the number of the angels of God, it really is something that comes from the book of Daniel. Remember where it talks about the angel over Persia and the angel mm -hmm. over Greece? Yep. And so the idea there is that every nation, every one of the every one of the seventy nations, has an angel over it. And when you know you talk about the angels of God, 
So they, the argument for many years that the scholars made is that, you know, the Hebrew wouldn't say the angels of God. The Hebrew would have said something like according to the number of the sons of God. And then they find this Dead Sea Scroll 4Q Deuteronomy J, which says the sons of God. And they say that proves that the original was just like in the Septuagint. Now, what's the idea here of the son, num, God dividing up the nation according to the number of the sons of God? So this we've got to go over to something else which is Deuteronomy 29, 25. And I think when we talked about this, I said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to hold off talking about it until we get to Deuteronomy 32. Mm -hmm. So now is time. Right. And there it says, talking about Israel sinning in the, in the curse. And it says, and they will go, Deuteronomy 29, 25 in the Hebrew, it says, and they will go and they will worship other gods and they will bow down to them, gods whom they have not known. And it says, Velo chalak lahem, which most translations have, and I think correctly so, they translate it something like, which he did not allow them. But you could also literally translate it. You could literally translate it as that he did not divide for them or he did not uh, give oh, to them. Okay, sure. And the implication that some people make from this is, oh, Israel wasn't given these gods, but the nations were given these gods. And the nations are allowed to worship idols. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is what some that's, people will say. That's bizarre. It is pretty bizarre. Now look at – now where are they getting this idea? They're getting it from two places. And uh, – one of the other places they're getting it from is Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. It says, lift, uh, and this is talking about Israel again sinning. It says, unless you lift your eyes to the heaven and you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, and you will go astray and you will bow down to them and worship them. Uh, uh, it says, which Yehovah, and what does your translate actually in Deuteronomy 4, 19? Here, look, the King James says, which the Lord thy God has divided unto all the nations under the whole heavens. That's the King James Version. Okay. And, um, uh, and take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which Jehovah your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heavens as a heritage. Some people read that and say, hey, look, God gave the, uh, the nations, the sun, the moon, and the stars to worship. And they're allowed to worship sun, the moon, and the stars. That's, that's some people's understanding of that verse. I think it's completely wrong. I think we probably talked about it when we did Deuteronomy 4. Mm. If not, um, so there's another place this shows up. And the other place this shows up is, hold on. And basically what they're saying is, yes, God divided the nations and gave each one of them an angel to worship. That, oh, that's, that's what's behind the Septuagint translation. That's and, that is, and that is pinned on, on, on uh, Daniel, right? Because no other, no other book in the Tanakh does that. Well, Daniel doesn't, doesn't say that the people were given angels to worship. No, but, but that's, that's, the understanding. that's where the connection is made, that's, right? That's what the Septuagint is basically saying. Mm. And, that, and, that, and, they're, and they're combining that with, like I said, Deuteronomy 29, 25 and Deuteronomy 4, 19. And then the other key passage uh, is uh, – so look at Isaiah – Chapter 2, it's one of my favorite pro pro uh, prophecies, and this is one of the 20 or 30 most important verses in the Bible. I'd Please. even put it up in the top 10. Um, and it says in verse 2, it shall come to pass in the end of days, and that's important, Acherita yamim, end of days. Mm -hmm. Go back to the last verse, or second to last verse of Deuteronomy 31, just before we get to the poem we're reading in 32, the, the Song of Moses, and it'll tell you this is for the latter days, this poem, this song. And mm -hmm. latter days in Hebrew is the same phrase as here, end of days. It's for the end times. It shall come to pass in the Achrit, I mean the end times, the mountain of God shall be established uh, at the head of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up from the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. They'll flow to it like a river. Mm -hmm. um, and it says in verse 3, and many nations shall go, and they shall say, uh, go, let us uh, go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us from his ways, and we will walk in his paths, Amen. for the Torah shall go forth from Zion, and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. Amen. And shall verse 4, you shall judge. Amen. Keith, are you asleep? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Look at that man, Keith Johnson. I'm in. <laughs> Come on, this is the verse. The Torah shall go forth from Zion. You've got a whole experience behind this. I mean, what? What is it? <laughs> We're flying over to Israel to sight the new moon because the Torah doesn't go forth from Florida. It goes forth from Zion. And verse Amen. 4. And uh, and uh, and he shall judge between uh, nations, and he shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is Isaiah chapter two, verse four, one of the most important verses of the Bible, and their spears into pruning hooks. And this is this is, by the way, to me, a, why is this such an important verse? You know, because people are always speculating, how will we know when the end times come? How will we know when the Messiah is here? And of course, Christians talk about when the Messiah comes back. For Jews, when the Messiah comes, how do we know when he comes or comes back? They will beat their swords into plowshares and their uh, spears into pruning hooks. <laughs> we won't have any question. No more shall nation lift up sword against nation. They shall no longer learn war. I can't wait for that day. Now, Amen. the prophecy ends here in Isaiah, but in Micah chapter 4, 
there's mm. another verse. And let me read the one in Micah 4. It's almost word mm-hmm. for word identical. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass in the end of days, the mountain of Yehovah, or the mountain of, yeah, the mountain of Yehovah shall be uh, established as the head of the mountains, shall be lifted up um, uh, over the hills, and the, many people shall flow to it. And many, verse 2, many nations uh, shall go, and they shall say, let us go up to the mountain of Yehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us from his, uh, and I'm reading it fast, it's the same words, teach us from his ways, and we will go in his paths, for from the Torah shall go forth from Zion, that's mm-hmm. Micah chapter 4, verse 2, almost identical to what Isaiah says, um, and the word of Yehovah from Jerusalem, and he shall judge between many nations, he shall... Uh, rebuke mighty nations from even from afar and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their pruning hooks uh, and their spears and the pruning hooks no longer shall nation lift up sword and they shall no longer learn war and then it says in verse 4 something it doesn't say in Isaiah uh, it says and each man shall sit under his uh, vine uh, and under his fig tree and they shall no longer fear for the mouth of Jehovah of hosts has spoken that's mm-hmm. the end of the prophet Micah chapter 1 verse 4 remember the chapters were introduced later but in Michael 1 verse Chapter 4, verse 4, the prophecy ends, for the mouth of Jehovah is spoken. And then what comes in verse 5 is the people who hear this, and they're really upset. They hear this, and they say, everyone's going to come to Jerusalem and say, teach us from the ways of the God of Jacob? No. Verse 5, for all the nations shall walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever. This is the response of the people when they hear what has been spoken at the mouth of Jehovah by Micah. They say, we're not sharing the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, Yehovah. Let mm. each man walk according to his own God, and we will walk in the name of Yehovah, our God, forever. Now think about right. that. What Micah just said, the exact opposite of message of what the people say in verse four, verse 5. So I've just got to say, in Micah 4, 5, there's absolutely nothing that indicates that to me when I read it in the English. That's... In the English, in, in 5, it says, for all the people, so, so 4 says, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of Jehovah of, of hosts has spoken, for all the people walk each in his in the name of his God. For all the people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever and ever. Right. So is that really what Isaiah what uh, Isaiah and Micah just said? What Isaiah and Micah just said is the exact opposite of that. Right. And this is a common thing that the prophets will do. They'll they'll have a prophecy and then they'll be the response of the people. And the response of the people is very often the opposite of what the prophet just said. Very mm-hmm. common, very common thing. And sometimes they'll say the people say this, and other times they'll just quote the people. I mean, because imagine they're, they're standing there in the public square, and they're preaching these things, and the people respond to what they're saying. And, you know, they're, later on it was written in a book, but originally this was sort of a dialogue. And, um, and what the people are saying here is really it's, it's the Greek spirit. That each nation, they've got an angel over them, and they'll worship that angel, they'll worship, they'll worship that god, and of course they misunderstand the angel, and they turn the angel over India into Vishnu, and they turn the angel over, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, say, name, name the name of another, uh, the, the name, yeah, the one over uh, China, they turn into Buddha or Confucius or whatever, I don't, you know, I don't really know, and, um, you know, and then other people have an angel they worship, and they, they call him Allah, oh, and, um, you know, so, so so basically, what happens is people end up worshiping angels. They end up worshiping the the um you know the that that which God sent set mm-hmm. over each of the nations to keep an eye on it, to keep watch after it, and to protect it. And they end up worshiping that. And this is this is what paganism is about. It's not that they don't worship the true God, but they end up worshiping the angels. They end up worshiping the intermediary, the messenger, instead of the one who sent the messenger. Mm-hmm. And um, and this is this is the Greek spirit. This is the spirit here that Micah is speaking against, really, mm-hmm. in Micah chapter four, verse five. Now, what's really interesting, Keith mentioned how we uh, we were um, we going to be on a radio program, and uh, and we were kicked off because uh, they said Nehemiah is not a believer, and and all my Jewish brothers and sisters said is Nehemiah an atheist? No, he's just not a Christian believer. Um, so I posted this on a, on a discussion group on the internet mm-hmm. to hear what people's response was. And let, let me read you what I wrote. Sure. Uh, and I actually quoted Keith. Keith wrote as follows. He says, I have a radical idea. Since some folks are uncomfortable with a Methodist and a Jew ministering together, meaning he was talking about the radio, what if we start a one new man congregation for Jews and believers? And of course, he means Messianic Christian believers. What could be the name of such a congregation? And then I wrote, has Keith left the reservation or is he on to something? <laughs> mm. And then I wrote, for my Jewish brothers and sisters, is there any way we can worship together with people who believe Jesus is the Messiah but want to live by the Torah? Can we focus on our common ground or is it a lost cause? And we had hundreds of responses to this. And, um, and it wasn't a rhetorical question. I don't know. Can it work? 
I guess time will tell, just like Keith's video, time will tell. Um, but here's the really interesting, here's what, I, what Keith calls the money ball. A guy named Herbert, and I won't say his last name on the radio, but a guy named Herbert posted, he said, Micah 4-5 says it all. For all the peoples go forward, each in the name of its God, while we go forward in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Herbert is echoing the Greek spirit. He is echoing the spirit that Micah 4-5 is speaking against. And he's quoting it as the word of God. <laughs> Remember, the word of God of Micah 4, 4 ends in verse 4. For the mouth of Jehovah of hosts has spoken it. And then he quotes the exact opposite message, evidently from the people. That's how it's always been understood. But he's quoting that as what we should do. We don't want to pray with those Gentiles. We don't want to interact with those people who have a different understanding. Forget the common ground. Let them walk in the name of their gods. We'll walk in the name of our God. And everyone will be happy. Except our Father in heaven. Um, it, mm -hmm. hmm. Keith, you've got well, to have an no, opinion on this. Come on. No, no, I actually do have an opinion. And it's interesting that Nehemiah would bring this up because, um, uh, you know, by the time folks uh, are reading this, like I said, we're in the midst of a bit of a, a firestorm regarding this because there are some people, Jew and Gentile, that have very strong feelings. And, and, and the feelings are tend to be like this. The, the concept is, yes, let's all come together, but not really. <laughs> like I, let me let me just make one one little quote that I got this morning. It says this: This man's name is Daniel. He said that that kind of a congregation already exists. It's called a messianic congregation, but they are deluding themselves because they're neither one nor the other. Our common ground is well and good for dialogue, but not for united worship. Because some will worship the true God, while others will worship an idol or some combination of both, and this is unacceptable. So the issue becomes. <laughs> You know, we're going to decide ahead of time, okay, here's who's worshiping this way and here's who's worshiping that way. What I actually asked, and I asked this question very intentionally, Jono, and, and I think even you would you would agree with it. W when we use the word believers, we used a capital B. So, Nehemiah, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Do you Sir, consider yourself a believer? Absolutely, I'm a believer. Jono, do you consider Nehemiah a believer? I certainly do. Well, I want to be the one to say that I didn't consider him a believer because I thought that believers – were only the believers in a certain way of belief. When this was posted, I did include Nehemiah in as a believer, as a capital B. And uh, it's even, you know, we've, we've talked about this in the Torah, talking about believing in Moses. What does it mean to believe in Moses? And I could get really radical on the radio today, but I'm not going to, because uh, Nehemiah and I had a little conversation, Jonah, that I'm going to wait to have a special show just so we can talk about this. Nehemiah is willing to come forth and make it his proclamation of faith. But in the oh. meantime... Let me just say that that there really is a, a judgment that takes place. You know what happens regarding... when you assume you make an ass of you and me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this All point, right. this point of what 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 is that faith and the basis of that faith and who we are, mm -hmm. who it is that we're worshiping. So I just want to say, uh, for me, Jono, and and I, what I've loved about this program is to find the ways where we do have this point, this common ground, this belief, and even this issue of the El Emuna, the faith that we do have. That is that is connected, and there's so many people that talk about the idea of coming together, but they really aren't intending it at all. In fact, they would prefer you go and you go, we go worship something else, worship somebody else, worship a different deal, and then leave us to the true to the true worship as if you know they, they've got the corner of the market, which is mm -hmm. not the case at all. So mm -hmm. that's all I have to and, say. You know, it's interesting you say about about you know people talk about unity and they want to have unity, and and Keith and I actually did a, a couple years ago we did a, something called. I forget what it was actually called. It was something like a unity conference, and it was supposed to be Jews, Christians, Messianics, all coming together in unity and talking about common ground. And it might have even been called the Common Ground Conference. Um, you know what I'm talking about, Keith, over in Oregon. Of course and I do. And af after the event, they did these, this, these little, like, little snippet interviews, um, like in private, not in front of the audience. They did these little interviews, and they asked people, well, what is the common ground? And there were five people there, three of the people – there was uh, – I won't even say what they were. Three of the people said the common ground is Yeshua. The common ground is Yeshua. The common ground is Yeshua. And then I come on and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> How can you say the common ground is Yeshua? This is supposed to be for Jews, Christians, and Messianics. How could you say the common that, – like that's insulting. I'm sorry, guys. The common ground is what I said and what Keith said. The common ground is the word of God in Scripture and our Heavenly Father. You know, I've got nothing. I don't begrudge anybody who believes in Yeshua. I've got nothing against that. You know, I, I respect them for their faith. I obviously have a. I'm, I'm a believer with a big B in 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 the in the Song of Moses and the message of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. But but uh, come on, if we're talking about common grounds, the common ground for different 
for the 33,000 Christian denominations may be Yeshua, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not putting that down. But if you're coming to a Jew and talking about common ground, then the common ground is our Heavenly Father, which, you know, Christians claim they believe in, mm-hmm. and the Word of God, you know, which Christians claim they believe in. Now, of course, the Christians have got the idea that the Word became flesh, but whether the Word became flesh or it's written down in a book or on our hearts, it's still the Word of God, and Jews believe in that Word of God with a capital B. So let's focus on that common ground when we're talking about Jews and, and Christians coming together. Well, let me, let me say this, Jonah, and since we're doing this, we're, since we're, we're on this rant, so, so here's what, one of the reasons that I that I am Rant. so that I don't I don't want to I don't and, and and this is this is the part that I think is the tension, where I don't want to give an out for Nehemia, and I don't want to give an out for the people that maybe have a different uh, perspective of w- what the what the focus of belief is, is see where where I get excited is I say okay does anyone realize what we're talking about here okay we're going to go to china to talk about a message that yeshua the people that people over here would say okay yes he's the focus that he taught which happens to be based on the very word of god that we're doing in torah curls so when i talk about i love this idea of being able to study the bible that yeshua studied in his language history and context why is that so important for me because i really don't want to let anyone have an easy out mm. the, the the messianics the christians the methodists the Jews, the Karaites, I'm sorry, Karaites are Jews. Me, sorry about that. Uh, different, 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 different group, different, depending on Karaite who you Karaite Jews, to. Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, Orthodox, Conservative Jews. Exactly. That and I, Reconstructionists, that I, I, who nobody knows, really knows the, what that is. But I want, to keep, I want to keep the tension there that I can look at the very Bible that Yeshua studied, looked at, uh, um, uh, read, that's quoted in the New Testament. I can go to the very Tanakh that's quoted in the New Testament. We mm-hmm. just did it with Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk. And when I see those things, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's the basis of that? It's the Word of God. And, and I, I want to keep it there. I'm not one of these liberal, oh, just whatever you believe is fine, and whatever you think is fine, and oh, whatever, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. That's I think the it's Bigorian very spirit. Each man will live by his faith. There's, you can believe there's in Buddha, a line, you can believe in anything you want. Listen, let me say this. There's a line in the sand, and where I'm going to stand is here. Here's where I'm going to land. stand at the line in the sand. The word of God is the common ground. And the minute Nehemiah steps off of that, I will beat him over the head, and I hope he'll do the same for me. Amen. Okay. He, uh, he found him in a desert land, this is verse 10, and in the wasteland in a howling wilderness, he encircled him, he instructed him. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to stop you, but we didn't, we didn't give the money ball of the, of the 4Q Deuteronomy J in, in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, there we go. Sweet. So the Dead Sea Scrolls supposedly confirm the Greek spirit, that each nation has an angel over it, and you know, and they're, they've been given those angels to worship. That, that's the Greek spirit that, that – you know, that's what the Septuagint essentially says. And, uh, and so they, they found this Dead Sea Scroll where in Hebrew it said the same exact thing. So I, this was back in the 90s. I remember one of the professors presented this, and I ran to the library at, at uh, Mount Scopus to look at this, and, and it had just been published. And to be honest with you, I'm pretty sure the professor had never seen the actual Dead Sea Scroll manuscript or even the mm-hmm. photograph of it because this is something that had been talked about for 40 years in, 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 a, in um, biblical scholarship. And uh, so I ran to the library, and it had just been published fresh off, fresh off the presses. You could still smell that fresh smell nice. of, a, of, of a book. And I opened it up to look at 4Q Deuteronomy J, and I found out it was a tiny scrap of paper which said, the sons of God. The word number wasn't there. In fact, the rest of the verse wasn't there. The chapter wasn't there. And, and I brought this back to the professor, and I said to her, how do you know this is Deuteronomy? I, I see it says what you, what you think it should say in Deuteronomy. But how do you know this is Deuteronomy? How do you know this isn't Job? How do you know it isn't some, mm. some you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain hundreds of documents which aren't even the Bible. Sure. And this doesn't match what it says in our Bibles. It doesn't really match what it says in, in, uh, in the Septuagint because the Septuagint says the angels of God and this said the sons of God. And this doesn't say anything about the numbers because it's only a few words. It's basically two words on that line, sons of God. And she said, I don't know. That's just what the scholars have said. Tradition! <laughs> Tradition! <laughs> Just, and the yeah. bottom line is, you can't say that's Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy says something else. <laughs> Just repeating what you've been told. Oh man, boy, this. Yep, yep. we fall so into that is, all the this time. Is, this is, you know, and this is my approach, which is always, you know, I say I was born and raised in Illinois, lived in Israel for 19 years, but deep in my heart, I'm from Missouri. And the Missouri, I don't know if you know this, Jono, but the motto of the state of Missouri is "Show me." It's called the "Show me" state. Really? I got to mm-hmm. see it for myself because people, the, the smartest people in the world. We'll state things as facts, which are not facts. They're opinions. All right. Brilliant. Amen. Brilliant. And good day to everybody listening in Missouri. 
He kept him as the apple of his eye, as, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreads out its wings, taking them up, carrying on them on his wings, on its wings. So Yehovah alone led him, <coughs> and there was no foreign god with him. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yehovah alone led him. Is that what you got in your, your, your English, Keith? Yeah. Yehovah Absolutely. alone led him. Mm-hmm. Wow. And there was another verse that, um, that you know, this, this immediately brings in a, uh, an association for me. Mm-hmm. So can we real quickly turn to Isaiah 43, mm-hmm. verse 11? Mm-hmm. And somebody read that to me in your English. Uh, I, even I, am Yehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. I love that verse. You know, and again, that's the, you know, exactly oh, let me what he keep says. Going. Let me keep yeah. going. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there, and there was no foreign God among you. Come therefore, on with that. Therefore, you are my witnesses, mm-hmm. says Yehovah, that I am God. And, you know, there's this group over in Brooklyn called the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and, and I got I to gotta, I gotta stop here for a little little tangent. The Jehovah's. So and, uh, and the Jehovah's Witnesses took this verse and they said, we, this little cult in Brooklyn, were Jehovah's Witnesses. And it, isn't that, it disgusts me how this small little group can usurp this concept that Isaiah talks about. And, and, you know, Keith and I have, have taught what it says in the Aleppo Codex, that the na- proper pronunciation of God's name is Yehovah, if you want to say Yahweh, knock yourself out. But in the Hebrew manuscript, says Yehovah, and people say, but isn't that what the Jehovah's Witnesses say? And I went and researched this, and it turns out if you ask the Jehovah's Witnesses what's the proper pronunciation of God's name, guess what they'll tell you? Yehovah? On their own website. No, they say it's Yahweh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's on their website. <laughs> so why do they say Jehovah? Well, they say Jehovah is very well known, so we're going to say that. But the true pronunciation they say is Yahweh. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so those Yahweh witnesses are out there proclaiming. But the true witnesses of Yehovah are his people. That's what it says here. Not some little group in Brooklyn. His true witnesses are his people, Amen. those who are faithful, those who have emunah in him. Amen. Um, Amen. And uh, can you read verse 13 there? Keep reading the next verse because that actually parallels also something over in it's – it's actually a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 32 of different parts of it. That's what I love about these prophecies. What it, prophecies 13? make it up. They're, they're, they're quoting what it says essentially. Yeah. Indeed before the day was – Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Mm-hmm. Is that what it says? Well, that's what mine says. Mm-hmm. What? In 13, 43, 13. So maybe the verse numbers are different. Read the verse before that. So that was, uh, I, I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says Yehovah, that I am God. Indeed, it goes on to say 13, indeed. Before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver it out of my hand. I work. There it is. There it is. And who will reverse it? Right. There's no one who can deliver out of my hand. That's also, we're going to see that later in uh, Deuteronomy mm-hmm. 32. And the one I'm looking for, though, is probably somewhere else. So, But but there it is. It's the same message of Deuteronomy 32. There's, there's no other savior with him. He's there all alone. There's no foreign god. Our heavenly father is the one who does this all by himself. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Most certainly. All right, we're moving on. He made him ride on the heights of the earth, that he might eat the produce of the fields, that he might draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle and milk from the flock, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the choicest wheat, and you drank wine, the blood of the grapes. So let me say, let me say this. So, Jonah, when you read this, being that you're, uh, you're a man of the land... When you read this particular phrase, this idea of the the, the lambs and the goats, and the goats. <laughs> so what? That was funny. That was funny. What do you say? Made me hung- said it makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so when you read that, you read from a different perspective than I do, being a city guy. Well, no, I mean, I, particularly in verse fourteen, curds from the cattle and milk. I mean, honey makes the most incredible cheese uh, mm-hmm. from from cow's milk and goat's milk. She makes awesome cheese and uh, and yogurt from goat's milk and all sorts of stuff there. And, uh, and, of course, we do have goats, and so we have goat's meat, and uh, we live on a farm that also has uh, sheep, and we quite often have lamb, and yum! And, uh, and, 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 and by the way, <laughs> a vineyard as well. Our landlord has uh, a, a vineyard wow. and uh, uh, quite often gives us cases of really nice wine, That's the blood amazing. of the grapes. That's just amazing. It's just amazing. Mm-hmm. We were talking about this, just the, the whole perspective whenever, whenever we're reading in the Tanakh. At the Torah, and we're hearing about the land and things like that. That in the, in, back in days past, so many more people were farmers, and then today, mm. many people read these things and don't even get uh, a sense of what it is. Certainly, I don't. You know, it, it was the trip to Israel that really helped me to see 
how important the land is and how it oh, actually. I, I understand what, what you're saying, Keith. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, look, I mean, we, we both came out of we both came out of uh, Sydney. Uh, both both Honey and I we grew, we grew up in Sydney, and when we first moved out to uh, the country, when we got out of the city, um, I remember you know being up close and personal, you know, by myself in the middle of nowhere with a flock of sheep, and I just thought it was the most amazing, incredible thing. It was like you know. It was it was just it was an amusement park of nature, if I can put it that way. I was just so excited to be there, taking it all in, and there was so much that we learned in the in the in the first, and we still learn uh, over the years of being in an agricultural environment and seeing all the uh, object lessons throughout the Tanakh and going, oh, that's what that means. We had no idea exactly. what that. Meant. That's what I was going to say, and and you know that's why I think, um, and and this is what's been so amazing the these last ten years for me now. Many times, I've actually been many times with Nehemiah over in the land and getting a chance to see, uh, read these verses and to read different aspects of the verses mm -hmm. and to actually see the land, to see what it is that Moses is talking about and to look and to put your hands in the dirt and to see, yeah. what, you know, it just changes the whole uh, understanding expectation as you're reading the Bible. It just changes everything. It gives you a completely different dimension. So I have to give this quick little thing, if there's still room, I'm not sure if there will be by the time you hear this, but uh, if you go to uh, on, on uh, truth to you org or kisalowednamecom the 3T tour, uh, there mm -hmm. may be room. Not sure if there will be by then, but if there is, we would love to have you. It's a good chance for people to come and see the actual land in its actual, uh, you know, I mean, it's there. And it's like we're not reading some fantasy land. This is not like mm -hmm. uh, Atlantis that we're talking about. The Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> yeah. The Chronicles of Narnia actually, will actually be there. Yeah. We're going to be traveling all throughout exactly. the land. And, uh, and, and, and you're going to be taking us to some incredible places. Exactly. Um, really looking forward to that. And so if, if you're quick, if there's any room left on the coach, people, uh, you can click on there's an Israeli flag. There's a, a button on the right-hand side of truthtoyou.org. Uh, or you can go straight to hishallowedname.com uh, and get the details there on the 3T tour to Israel. March, first couple of weeks, March 2013. Let me say this also. The other reason this is important is is because of what I think, uh, you know, Nehemiah mentioned it earlier, you know, and we're getting ready to talk about this in just a second. So just this idea that, that the things that we have in Scripture, again, remember these people are coming once every seven years and they're sitting there and Moses is, is speaking and he's preaching at different times here. He's singing. He's teaching these people this song. It's amazing. I consider this sort of like a hip hop, the way that Moses does this just because <laughs> he's, the rapping he's, rap <laughs> he's rapping this song. But the point is, is that... Um, Again, and I, again, I want to just say this, is that the chance to actually encounter these things that are in Scripture, not just in terms of being in Israel, but the actual concepts and applying them in our lives. Mm -hmm. This was the idea of the Torah. It was not written as some kind of, you know, if I can use this word, some law in the middle of some black book that's up on some lawyer's shelf that you pull mm -hmm. down and open up in law number 612. No, this was actually a chance mm -hmm. to encounter the God of Israel and to be embraced by him and to embrace him in a way that was practical. So I want people to realize that, you know, we're not, we didn't go through this whole thing just for people to say, you know, here's, here's where we can get out of it. Rather, this is a privilege to understand what it means to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. What That's you're really saying is that this is the living, breathing word of our heavenly father. Absolutely. I'll go with that. Amen. Yes. Whew. <laughs> is it wrong that I'm excited? Am I allowed to be excited about this? You can be excited about this. I, yeah. I, 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 no, no, no. I, I, I preached at this place uh, like a month ago, and, and afterwards I, I was rebuked. They said, you were too excited. Only Keith is allowed to be that excited. And I'm like, <laughs> so basically you're saying I've got to pretend I'm not excited because the people don't want me to be excited. They, they're just not expecting it. They're not ready for it. <laughs> I'm excited. And I, can't, I can't hold it back. <laughs> okay, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. And it ain't the coffee. It's the living, <laughs> breathing word of Jehovah. Amen. Amen. But uh, but Yeshurun, Yeshurun grew fat and yes. kicked. Now this is here's a verse. I don't. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat. You grew thick. You are obese. Is yes. what I've got. That's what I've got in mind. It says then he forsook God who made him, and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. There's the rock again. The rock of his salvation. And what's the word for salvation, Keith Johnson? Well, do, do, it depends. You, you you want me to give uh -oh. you the. Uh... <laughs> Which one do you want Come me to give on. you? The theological one or the one where it actually work, says it's Work with me here. Work with me. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so the I'm word for salvation you. is Yeshua. Yeshua. Yes. And here it's actually Yeshua To, which means his Yeshua. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I'm, there may be some people out there who say, oh, that's Jesus. 
Yeshua, but actually Jesus in Hebrew, or the name behind Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, which actually is short for Yehoshua, which means Yehovah Yoshia, Yehovah saves. And so, you know, this is a noun that we have here, a, 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 what's called a, a, a common noun, Yeshua, with the emphasis in the final uh, syllable. It has a hey at the end, a silent hey. Um, and then Yeshua is, uh, is a name, which they call a proper noun, and it's actually made up of a, it's a compound of, of, um, of a, a noun a, a noun and a verb, which is Yehovah Yoshia, and that might sound like a whole bunch of uh, uh, grammatical mumbo jumbo, but here, here's the way you can remember it. Yeshua is masculine, and Yeshua is feminine, and I know that because it ends in the kamatz hey, and it means salvation. Now, obviously, the two words are related, and if people want to say theologically that, you know, this is a reference to um, – because it does mean salvation. So if they want to say this is a reference to Yeshua, I mean, theologically, I can't prevent you from saying that or – Really, you know, you're entitled to believe that. But first, understand the literal meaning here, which is the rock of his Yeshua, the rock of his salvation. <laughs> and that is common ground that we can all get excited about. Amen. We, you know, exactly. Can, can I get an amen? amen. Uh, I'm, that's, I'm, that's I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to downplay this and pretend I'm not excited. And <laughs> no, no, no. yes, this is the <laughs> let feminine. Me step, now, let me step in and say this, though. Let me say this. Uh, one, one of the beauties of one of the beauties of, of actually looking into the language is because we do get a chance to see where we don't have to retrofit. And, and we, when I mean by retrofit, we, we don't actually have to take a theological concept and force it into the Tanakh or force it into the verse. Let the verse speak. Understand what the verse says. And you know, you'll find things that are even more beautiful. Things that Yeshua, the man, actually said that are wonderfully connected to what we read. And then there are other times where people, try, like I say, try to retrofit it, and then you, you come up with all these theological gymnastics, which I don't think mm. we have to do. I will say this, another commercial. Uh, we had a big argument, Nehemi and I, because I added a bonus section in the back of the book, His Hollywood Name Revealed Again, at hishollowedname.com. And in the, in the, the, the back of the book, was an entire uh, chapter. It's called the bonus chapter on the name. What about the name Jesus? And the reason that I did it is because when I would speak to my Jewish brothers and sisters, they would understand more about the name Jesus than many of the Christians did. And I thought, okay, so why not give people a chance to get the actual linguistic information, and then you can make your, your decision from there. And I think they would be surprised if they just went through the biblical grammatical issues regarding the name Yeshua, Jesus, they might be uh, pleasantly surprised on what that name really means mm. and how they can make a connection without having to do what I call linguistic gymnastics. <laughs> yep. Wonderful. They provoked okay. him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not oh, to boy. God, to gods oh. they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals, that, our, that your fathers did not fear the rock who begot mm. you. You are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. Well, hey, so I, I'm, I'm taking an exception with that translation of verse 17, um, and I think we probably talked about this when we did uh, some other section, or maybe not. I guess not. So anyway, so the word here they translate as demons is shedim, and mm -hmm. the problem with translating that as demons is that uh, God, Yehovah, is actually called by the same exact word, and we know he's no demon. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually called El Shaddai, which some people translate as the uh, God of my breast, which is ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. El Shaddai it means God, my spirit, and Shed actually means a spirit. And what this is saying in, in Yehovah is a spirit. He's God, my great spirit. And they, uh, that's actually the translation of Shaddai, my great spirit. The great is mm -hmm. expressed by the plur plurality. But here it says they're, they sacrifice to Shedim, to spirits who are not God. So the problem isn't that they're that they're Shadim. The problem is that they're Shadim who are not God. And this is exactly the the Greek spirit we talked about before. That each nation was given a, 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 a an angel to worship, a spirit, and uh, it was given to them as their inheritance. And here he, he's rebuking them for doing it. Mm. They mm. they sacrifice to a spirit who is not God, a God who they have not known. Uh, and so this is the problem when we're dealing with uh, worshiping spirits, worshiping angels. We should only worship the one true God, not enter any intermediary, not any substitute, but the but the the God who is a chad. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. There amen. Go. And when Yehovah saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation uh, of of his sons and his daughters, and he said, "I will hide my face from them. I will." See what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. Okay. Mm. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But uh, I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. 
For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. I've got hell. Okay. It shall <laughs> consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. Jonah, right, let me so say this. I want to, let's, just a second, Nehemiah. Just, 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 just a second. Let me, just a second. <laughs> Okay. So let, let me let me say this. The the one thing that I do think is is, and I want to remind want people to be reminded again what's happening. So so Moses comes down and you know he's he's standing before the people and he says, look, I'm, I'm going to change this up a bit. I'm going to give us a song. And so he starts to rap his song and he's and he's he's giving this song. And and I think the the thing that I think when I'm when I'm reading through this and I hear this, it makes me slow down just a little bit. And the, and the slowdown really comes down to just one simple thing. If I can say, for me, one of the most important verses in the entire Bible is this. <laughs> <Three says. laughs> okay, so he says this. Um, He's mocking me. <laughs> I, will hide, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see mm. what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. And then he tells us why they are. It says here, they make me jealous by what is no God mm. and angered me with their worthless idols. And I think that that has got to be... For me, if you want to talk about the thing that frustrates, upsets, makes <laughs> or the creator of the universe uh, angry, jealous, uh, whatever you want to call it, more than mm-hmm. anything is this idea that there's somehow some competition with him. That mm-hmm. there's some idea that, yes, well, you know, here's this God over here and here's this God over there. That, that's, that's the, would, you, would you both agree that the, co- the core of the issue becomes he takes him out from this, this place where there are all these false gods. He shows that these are false gods. He stands way. There. He does this radical thing. Mm-hmm. He brings them out to the thing. He says, mm-hmm. I am Yehovah, your God. Amen. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods in my face. You have no gods, mm. you know, besides me. Whatever, and 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 doesn't that become the issue? The drum that gets continually beaten. Mm. The drum mm-hmm. that gets beaten. We want to have another god. We want to have another. We want one we can look at. We want one that we can see. We want one that we can put a, you know, this on or that on or make golden or do whatever. And he's like, look, you're you're, you're fooling yourself. There is no other besides me. So I just, you know, I just think that's important that he that he keeps reminding them over and over again. And what do they keep doing? Creating other gods, doing the very thing that's going to cause them to be oh, and, banished. And from bringing, bringing the wrath of God upon them. And yeah, he goes exactly. on to say, I will whoa, whoa, hate this. Verse 20, we got to just really quickly, verse 20, it's, he says, I will hide my face from them. Yeah. And really, we, uh, you know, we, we've been talking for quite a while, so let's, let's try to cut it short. So I'm going to refer people to my book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, The Hebrew Power of the Priestly Blessing Unleashed, mm. where I talk about this whole concept of God hiding his face, which really is a central theme that appears repeatedly throughout, throughout the Hebrew Bible. Um, this idea of God hiding his face, it's a very important mm. concept. Um, and, um, you know, and also brilliant you book. mentioned... You, no, 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 uh, brilliant, brilliant book. And, uh, enough, and you, you. You, you do it, you, you really do a good job at that. And just a reminder, everybody, NehemiahsWall.com, NehemiahsWall.com is there where is. you can purchase that book. NehemiahsWall.com. Hey, and, and also uh, you talk here about hell, and of course the Hebrew word is Sheol. Sheol is, in, in, in the Hebrew, is this, uh, some people translate it as the grave, but really it's the, the realm of the dead. It's where you go when you die. It's a place where, according to Ecclesiastes 9, there's no thought or action or, or knowledge in Sheol. Mm-hmm. This is why in in, uh, in, um, in the Psalms it talks about the dead can't praise uh, God. The dead don't know anything. The dead don't think. They don't talk. And it's really interesting because you know you talk here about how they, they made me jealous with that, but with that which is not God. And you said that means they worshipped other gods. And I want to challenge that. I agree. I agree that they worshipped other gods, but they also did something else. Something that happens in some circles to this day, mm-hmm. that rather than worshiping other gods, they worshipped um, God through an intermediary. And uh, just to, so you understand what I'm talking sure. about, um, one of the oldest places in Israel. And I don't know if Keith is going to take you because it's kind of dangerous, but one of the oldest sites in Israel that that is a true biblical site is the, is the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron. And it's a very controversial site because half of the place is controlled by the Jews and half is controlled by the Muslims, and there have been uh, massacres where they they attacked each other. But um, uh, but this is actually a place a structure. The actual building was built by King Herod uh, in the BCs uh, <laughs> over 2,000 years ago, and um, and it's mentioned, of course, in the Bible, uh, the Tomb of the Patriarchs. And what happened at the Tomb of the Patriarchs, and still happens to this day with some people, is that the Jews would go there. And the, this is actually mentioned in some of the early rabbinical writings. It talks about how Jews would go there and they'd stretch out on the graves and they would pray to the patriarchs and say, would you intercede, on, please intercede on our behalf before God? Mm-hmm. And that's not praying to a false God. 
They're praying to the intermediary. They're saying, look, I can't come to you directly, God. I need someone to do it for me. Mm. And so they go to Abraham and they say, Abraham, I'm having trouble here. I'm laying on your grave. Please, Abraham, pray to the Almighty for me. I need some help. I need some intercession. Now, yes. intercession, there's nothing wrong with that in the Bible when you go to a prophet or a living person. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the dead, Deuteronomy 18 talks about uh, seeking the dead. They mm -hmm. sometimes translate it cleverly as necromancy, but it literally is seeking the dead. And so that's exactly what people do uh, at the grave, tomb of the patriarchs. And have been doing for 2,000 years. There's a reason Herod built a building there. It wasn't to honor the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. It was so people could come and pray to them and ask for intercession from them. And this is making God jealous with that which is not God. This is, I think, what Deuteronomy 32.21 is talking about. It also includes the idols, but it also is talking about those dead people who know nothing according to, uh, uh, according to the Psalms. Um, and this is what it talks about, you know, in, you know, it, this is, we quote this verse in a prayer to our father, uh, where Isaiah says, you are our father. Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, right? Mm. They're dead. <laughs> they can't help mm. us right now. You, Jehovah, are the only one who can help us, not the ancestors yeah. that people are praying to. In the time of Isaiah, they were doing this. Amen. They were going and praying to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the tomb of the patriarchs. Mm. This is, we are to pray directly to the creator and not amen. through an intermediary, not through there some There is no one between us and our creator, and amen. Ancestor. Amen. Yep. Amen. Mm. Amen. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand they have on made both jealous that with, is, that, that it's with, with that which is not God. Job 9.33 as well. So, um, where are we? <laughs> in, in the second half of 21, it says, And I will make them jealous with that which is not a nation, um, with that which is not a people, a, a, a scoundrelous nation, I will make them angry. What does that mean? What is mm -hmm. that which is not a nation? We know that which is not a god is an ancestor or a rap that, you know, something you're praying to, you're not supposed to be praying to or worshiping, you're not supposed to be worshiping. What is a nation which is not a nation? Okay, but I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. So, so they're not a nation, then they're a nation. Well, they're not a people, actually, is literally what it says, but they are a okay. nation. Okay. So what so does that mean? A foolish nation. It means it's Al-Qaeda. So you're joking about that, but this looks no, so I'm dead serious. And it talks about in the last chapter, it says, Achrita Yamim, the end, the end of time, the end of days. And verse 20 says, I will see what their end is. This might be talking about this last, last part in verse 21, might be a prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet. We might be coming right. to face something that hasn't come to pass yet. You know, because the Babylonians, they were nasty, but they were a nation. And the Romans, they were even nastier, and, but they were a nation. But here he's saying, I will make them jealous with that which is not a, a people. Uh, a scoundrelous nation, I will make them angry. So we might be dealing with some kind of entity, uh, in maybe in the present, but definitely in the future, which it's a concept. Uh, is, it's a, isn't concept. a cohesive nation, isn't a cohesive yeah. people, but is a nation that will come against us. Hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concept of terror, and 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 this is what the this is why these nations that aren't that that our nations can say we'll we'll, we'll grab a hold of the concept and become this new nation. The new nation is to to destroy Israel and to those who who stand with the God of Israel, etc. So mm. that's why I said the word Al Qaeda. I don't mind that I said it, and mm. uh, and any any yeah, organization there, but, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sure. an example of an entity which isn't which isn't really like it, it has the army like a no, nation. No, that's a, that's a but perfect, it is, yeah, but it, more, is, I think it isn't a cohesive perfect. people. It's it's this you know coalition of, of mm. these different. Look, like, I slipped it in when the time you had to sip his coffee. And... I slipped that in. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. No, that's that's right. that's uh, that's intriguing. In fact, is it time for a bathroom break? No, I. I actually slipped out when you were talking before. <laughs> no, I slipped out when you were talking before. You didn't even notice it. <laughs> and I came back and Joan's like, what do you think of that, Nehemi? I'm like, yeah. Um. <laughs> Here we go. I got it down I, to a science. <laughs> I will heap disaster on them. I will send my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction. I will also send against them the teeth of the beast with the poison of serpents of the dust the sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and the virgin, the nurse, nursing child and the man of gray hairs. I would have said, I will dash them to pieces. I will make them a memory and make the, mem make the memory of them and to cease from among men. Had I not feared the wrath of the enemy, lest the, their adversary should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high and it is not Yehovah who has done this. So basically, there's some entity that's coming against Israel, and they're gonna they're gonna you know kick our butts. They're gonna just you know really cause a lot of damage. And God's saying, look, I'm not gonna let them completely destroy Israel because then they'll think that they're the ones who did it. Exactly. They're gonna think that you know, this wasn't the God of Israel. This was our God. This was you know 
this was the God that we worship that gave us this victory, and Yehovah didn't want that to happen, and so he's he's uh, going to let them ca- wreak havoc and destruction, but only up to a point, to a point. so that they know who the true God is. Verse, now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing for me, because verse 28 and verse 29 then begs the question, because it, it, it says, for they are a nation void of counsel, uh, nor is there any understanding in them, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Is the they in these two verses, is it talking about the nation, the nations, or is it talking about Israel? Let's keep reading on verses 30 and 31. We'll see how, how confusing that becomes. How could one chase a thousand and put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and Yehovah had surrendered them? Now, so that's saying how, how could, to me, if I understand that correctly, how mm-hmm. could the nations uh, chase a thousand and put 10,000 to flight unless right. their rock had sold them, unless Yehovah had surrendered them right. Israel? So basically, this is talking about the nations these foreign powers chasing out, coming coming Israel. against Israel, and one of them will chase a thousand and two ten thousand. Hmm. It's almost the opposite, not almost it's the opposite of prophecies earlier in Deuteronomy, where there was a blessing of how a small number of Israelites would chase away many uh, of the of the foreigners of the invaders, and also that was in Deuteronomy or in Leviticus rather twenty six or so. And um, it's it's sort of like the the opposite of that is is going to happen because we sin, and um, and it's saying if this foreign nation understood that they would understand that um, the reason that they were victorious against Israel is because Yehovah had uh, turned had over it. Israel into, allow, had allowed it and essentially hmm. delivered Israel into their hand. Okay, so then, then uh, what we're saying is that from verse um, uh, 27 on to, on to verse 30, it's all talking about the nations. So 28 and 29 is talking about the nations, not Israel, right? That's my understanding, yeah. I, okay, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Uh, for their rock is not like our rock. Here we are with the rock again. Even our enemies themselves being judges for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and their fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gold, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of serpents and cruel venom of cobras. Mm-hmm. And, you and know, so one, here it's not clear. Is this notice. talking about is Israel or is it talking about the nations? Mm. Well, one, one other words, is, our rock is not like their rock. So who's saying that? Is that Israel saying that or is that the nation saying that? Well, if you read the NIV, it'll tell you because it'll give you a it'll give you a, a, a capitalize the R. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. the R. Oh, of rock. Yes, we okay. got rock. Now, does the Hebrew does the Hebrew have a capital R? Can you check for me? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But but you know what's great about the NIV is they let me know here because what's funny right. and I wanted to just share this with you guys <laughs> in verse uh, in verse uh, thirty. Uh, um, Jono, you said that verse thirty speaking of the nations, and so what the NIV does, it says, "Is how could one man chase a thousand and two put a thousand to flight unless mm-hmm. their rock." And speaking of their rock, he uses the, they use the capital R, right? Mm-hmm. Which I th- which I think is correct because yep. the parallel we'll and talk the, about parallel exactly because then they say and then the parallel is this Yehovah and then they say but for their rock is not like our rock. Now if I read that based on how how I'm reading this, it says so the, now their rock is is little R, which means that's not Yehovah. That's the that's mm-hmm. the uh, the angel that they worship. <laughs> and so, for, for exactly, and for those who don't know, obviously in Hebrew there are no capital letters, and whether there's right. a big R or a little R for rock, that's interpretation. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, exactly. uh, it's ambiguous. For our rock is like their rock. Mm, who's the R? Is that R Israel or R um, Al Qaeda? I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's not clear. But anyway, the two yeah. rocks are definitely different. They're definitely, definitely different. different rocks. And so when it says, when it talks about. Uh, Oh, oh, that they would consider their letter end in verse 29. It's talking about the, the if, could I say, the, the ruinous future of the nations? Um, I think so. In other words, the nation thinks, well, we, we've had this victory against the Jews. We've had this victory against Israel. We've got it all set. You know, our God has been victorious. Our angel that we worship has been, you know, has, or demon has been victorious. And uh, and the point is that uh, they don't understand how this works. They don't understand the now. This is interesting, be Keith, because a big surprise. In my in my New King James Study Bible, Keith, I've got a study note for that for that particular verse, and it says uh, often the phrase "latter end" is understood as a glorious future, but here it speaks of the ruinous future for the rebellious Israelites. Mm-hmm. Interesting. No, it, it doesn't mm-hmm. say that. That's what, it, that's what it says in my study notes. You're, you're messing with me, right? I'm telling you, it says that in my study notes. The ruinous future for the Israelites. For the Israelites. The Israelites are going to get punished. The rebellious sure, the Israelites. Foreign nation ruinous gonna, future for the yeah. it's the It's the foreign invader that's going to eventually, the, the one that attacks Israel. That's gonna, I mean, that, that's, that's this whole section we're talking about. Mm. 
Um, what? <laughs> so that's what it, that's that's how are, they would have you read it. The same passage I'm reading. This is what it says, you know. But it, if you read it that way, it's very clumsy, which is why I asked verse twenty eight and twenty nine. Well, it, verse thirty six, they're going to see that they're, they're they're missing the missing the boat. But okay. Mm. So verse thirty four. Uh, is this not laid up in store with me, sealed among my treasures? Vengeance is mine, and recompense their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. Now, now here, everyone understands that this is talking about God is going to take vengeance upon the foreigners who attacked Israel, right? But one would certainly hope so. I'm just going to double check. Well, because thought. the next verse, 36, for Jehovah judges his people, and upon his servant he has, uh, and it's interesting how yours translates that. How does it translate? Verse, read verse 36. Verse 36, for uh, Jehovah will judge his people and have compassion on Compassion! His <laughs> compassion when yes. he sees uh, nice. that their power is gone and there is no one remaining, bond or free. So yes. the point is, Israel is going to get you know, punished horribly by this this uh, Al Qaeda, this foreign non nation entity, this nation which isn't a people. It's going to suffer horribly at their hand. But eventually, Jehovah is going to look down and say, "Okay, they've had enough." And I don't want these foreigners thinking that that it was their God who caused this victory. Mm-hmm. It's time for me to step in and, ha- and have some mercy here. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm going to read verse. Uh, if, if I can continue, can I please, read this? Please. And in, uh, in uh, 57, where, uh, 37, where he says, "And he and he will say." Now, where are their gods, the rock that they took refuge mm-hmm. in? And I think when I read that in English and I, and I think about that, I think, okay, so they took refuge in a rock, and then we understand that we have a chance to take a refuge in a rock. And it's like, the, it's again, this, I, this, this parallelism, you know, which it's like saying, okay, choose? which rock are you going to choose? And you know what? I understand there are a lot of people, uh, and I did this, you know, I did this, you guys, and this is, I, I, I don't even know if I want to go down this road, but, but I might as well. Um, <laughs> There's a there 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 is a, there is some confusion, uh, Jono, uh, regarding the quote unquote uh, denomination that Nehemiah uh, has been a part of this this Karaite, um movement, and I've been getting people that send me notes and and and, and websites and mm-hmm. all sorts of things saying, no, this is this this is this is a Muslim thing, this thing. Muslim that, uh, thing. What? No, no, I'm telling you, yes, they they send it to me and they say believing the believing are, in the Tanakh and the Bible it makes you Muslim. Well, I'm just That's telling you what they say. Don't Muslims me, believe me, in the Quran? No, 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 no. Let me finish now. Let me go down this road for a second. And so that what they what everyone is doing is they're trying to find a way. And I, and actually, I believe the the website itself that's promoting this is actually um, has an agenda. Uh, which I won't go into right now. But the point is Look, that we there's... We checked it out, there's... tracked them down, the, the website that claims to be... So there oh, is geez. a website out there that claims oh, to be boy. a Karite website. <laughs> oh, Hold on. It claims, <laughs> it claims to be a Karite website, and it says Karites are Muslims. And people look at this and they say, hey, the Karites admit they're Muslims. Except if you look into the Whos website that is, it's actually a Messianic website. <laughs> so these are Messianics pretending to be Karites who are claiming they're Muslims. Um, now, why would the mess, these, this particular group of Messianics want to claim that they're Muslims, that Karaites are Muslims? And I think their agenda ha- – I mean, look, I don't blame Messianics for this because these guys are completely whacked out. These are lunar mm-hmm. Sabbatarians. These are people who – they're lunar Sabbatarians. And they're, and so they've got all kinds of weird agendas, which I don't blame Messianics for. I don't blame Christians for. But here's the moral of the story. Beware of what you read on the internet because you've got people pretending to be things that they're not. And then people pretending to be one thing and then pretending to be another thing. And, and, and it's just a lot of confusion out there. Mm. And there are people out there who want to sow confusion, who want to, who want to you know, spread True. disinformation because they've well, got an agenda. Was, Their agenda isn't get, the one. Keith. Jono, I didn't want to go into the details of the, the, the whole thing. I was just trying to simply say that the, you know, there, there are people who, who pick a rock and say this is our rock. And that's going to be the thing that they're going to believe in and they're going to hold to. And and, and one of the things that's so uh, interesting to me is this whole issue of borrowing of terms. What I think is really powerful about this is the borrowing of terms. Who Who is the first one that was called the rock? And then what other group goes and takes that and says, okay, now it's the rock? Whose name is Yehovah? And the others say, we'll call it Jehovah. Who's, who, who looks at the sighting of the moon? We'll also do that. The list goes on and on and on. And then what people do is they'll say, well, because this group does this, we won't do this because it, it sounds like that rather than looking at the root. What's the root of it? Yehovah is not afraid to say, yes, you've got a rock. He's not afraid to let him use that term. Hmm. The point is, is what's the basis of it? Your rock that you consider to be a rock is not a rock at all. Hmm. You know, your name that you proclaim to be the name, okay, 
and the list goes on and on and on. So, and and you know what you're really what you're really talking about, Keith, is what I call the counterfeit. And I talk yes. about this in Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, the Hebrew Power of the Priestly Blessing Unleashed. Which people can get from NehemiahsWall.com, but but in all seriousness, what you're talking about is the counterfeit. And Yehovah is telling us right here, there is a counterfeit out there. We've got the true rock, the one that's reliable, that's solid, the source of the water. And then we've got the other people who they've got a rock as well. They call mm-hmm. it the rock, big R, little R, no difference in Hebrew. They call it a rock. They trust in it. They believe in it. They believe their victories come from that rock. But guess what? Their rock is not like our rock. There's the true rock and there's the false rock. And in the Amen. end, we're all going to see which is the true one. Amen. Now Amen. see that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill oh. and I oh. make alive. Ooh, hang on. Beside? Beside me? Well, keep, finish the verse and then we'll talk okay. about that. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand, for I raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. Yes. Wow. So look. <laughs> He said, so it, read yours of verse 39, Keith. There is no God See, now I myself me. am he. There is no God besides me. You're kidding besides. me. Besides. Mm-hmm. So what it says in the Hebrew is, ve'en Elohim imadi, and there is no God with me. With me. Sounds like a subtle difference, but, the, you know, this is exactly what, what a lot of the pagan nations, you know, they say, they say, like, you know, ask somebody in India, and they'll say, you know, yeah, we, we, we believe in your God. You know, we just we believe in our gods, too. There's lots of gods. They're they're all all up there in heaven together. That's not the only uh, difference because once you do that, once you say, and there is no God with me, uh, Keith, we have to take the word God and put a little G there, right? That's exactly what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As opposed to what? You've got a big G there? Well, yeah, because it's saying there's no God. There's no capital G God besides me. No. No, There is is no capital G. (laughs) Yours is little G? Yes. Wow. Okay. All right. Interesting. Wow. Look, and, and can we look at a few other passages? By the way, Jonah, a little uh, cut this out. But if I plug this in, you're really going to get the noise. Hold on, let's try this. Are we okay? That's, yes. That's a very interesting hum. Very Wait, interesting. Hold on. Hum, so let me, let me try to... plugging into a different hole because I'm almost out of juice. Oh, hold on. Okay, okay. That's on purpose. <laughs> okay, Jonah, let's go for it. He's looking for a way to plug in, ladies and gentlemen. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about I put to death and I bring to life. Is that not powerful, Jonah? Well, it, it, doesn't it sort of uh, tie into uh, the, the the other verse that Nehemiah was reading out that says that he created he creates evil. Exactly. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Is that mm-hmm. bad? How's that? Do we have the and hum? No one and no one can deliver out of my hand. Wait, wait, wait. So do we have the hum? Yeah, yep, we still have the hum. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry about it. We'll deal That's with okay. it. That's okay. We're we're doing fine. Yep. Um, is there a home when now? he says in verse 40, I lift my hand to heaven and declare as surely as I live. This is so cool because, you know, we get this image when we go to court. I don't know if they do this over in Australia. Certainly here they do. I don't know if they do it in Israel. But they make you stand before, you know, the judges there and they take out the Bible. And put your raise your put your hand on the Bible and raise your hand, mm. you know, and, and this, this, this concept of him raising his hand saying, listen, I swear by myself. In other words, there's no greater thing to swear by. I, you know, saying, I, I, I am I, as surely as I live forever. I mean, that that is that's pretty darn powerful. Mm, mm, that's, absolutely, yeah. and of course, uh, as it says in thirty nine, now see that I even I am here, and there is no God with me. When mm-hmm. I when I raise my hand and I, and I say, as I live, mm-hmm. okay. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall deliver flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the army, uh, heads of the leaders of the enemy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, I, know you want, I know you want to run ahead, Jono, but can we just go back? Re- What's that really running again? For a sec- <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know you want to run ahead, Jono, but but can we just go back real quick for a second to uh, um, this thing about there's no God with me, which is what mm. it says in the Hebrew. And can we just read really quickly? I love this passage, Isaiah 63. It's this, this image of Yehovah as a warrior, mm. and he's coming as a warrior uh, from the south. And he, he's, you know, here we're reading about vengeance. Well, here he's taken vengeance against Edom against uh, Israel's enemies. Mm -hmm. Um, And it says, Who is this coming from Edom in crimson garments from Botsra? And crimson means he's covered in blood. Who is this majestic entire pressing forward in his great might? It is I who contend victoriously, powerful to give triumph. Mm. Why is your clothes so red, your garments like uh, his who treads grapes? And it's a dialogue. And he says, I trot out a vintage alone of the peoples. No man was with me. I trod them down in my anger, trampled them in my rain, rage. Their lifeblood bespattered my garments, and all my clothing was stained. Wow. 
So here he's describing his his destruction of the nations, you know, and he, this is exactly what he's talking about here, taking the vengeance. And he's saying, uh, you know, that's why his cl- clothes are symbolically covered with blood. For I had planned a day of vengeance and my year of redemption arrived. Then he says, and I lo- this is the key passage for me, then I looked, but there was none to help. I stared, but there was none to aid. So my own arm wrought the triumph and my own rage was my aid. I trampled peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk with my rage, and I hurled their glory to the ground. And tell me if this is not a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 32 in in much more poetical, symbolic language. It's talking about, there's no one with me, and when I take vengeance upon those nations, it's going to be me. I'm looking, and there is no helper, is what it literally says. I'm staring, and there is no one to support me. Uh, my own arm is 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 my salvation, and my uh, wrath is what uh, is what aids me, what helps me. Mm. So Yehovah is saying, "I'm going to take vengeance upon those nations, and it's going to be me. No one else is going to get the credit. I'm going to do it." Amen. Well, we've got to do this, you guys, jo- Jonah. We have to do this, and I and I know folks must be, you know, let let, let me do this. I'm going to do a Nehemiah. I'm going to pull a Nehemiah, and I'm going to turn over to Exodus 15 very quickly, if we can. If you guys go to Exodus 15, I want to I want to read something. Um, that's that I really, really, really think is connected to this, mm. uh, and I want uh, Nehemiah, if he would, uh, I'm sorry, Jonah, if you would read Exodus fifteen three. It says, uh, "Yehovah is a man of war. Yehovah mm-hmm. is his name." Amen. And so, in in so Yehovah ish, ish milchama, uh, this idea of being a man of battle, and this, and, and of course, this also happens to be the same sort of format that we find in Deuteronomy, which we didn't get a chance to talk about just as much as I wanted to, but it has to do with this idea of the poetic form Mm -hmm. of God's name. And so what I want to do really very quickly is go to Exodus 15.2, and Nehemi, I want you to read it in Hebrew, and then I want you to read yours in English, 15.2, that verse, Nehemi. Exodus 15, verse 2, it says, Ozi vizim ratia vayhi lishua. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yah is my strength and my song, and he has become for me salvation. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, in English, uh, Jono? I, it says, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Right. And so even if we were doing a Torah pearls and people have kind of caught on to this idea that when we see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, we say Yehovah. I, I would say Yehovah, course, yeah. When we taped this earlier, ladies and gentlemen, and then it didn't come through, we tricked Nehemiah and made him read it in uh, in Hebrew, and, and then he translated it in English, and he said Yehovah. That was the one time I finally caught him, and of course that's been lost in cyberspace. We don't have that. But this time he knew not to do that, but the idea being that when I didn't fall Jonah reads – he didn't fall for it this time because he already knew. But when Jonah read the verse in uh, in English and did his translation, Jonah will translate it and he says, and, and the Lord, and, and then he said, and Yehovah. And then, of course, Nehemiah uh, did the same thing as far as translation because he understood that Yah is the poetic form of God's name. And then we have, of course, the folks that are Yahwehist and others who say, here, it's proof. And, of course, maybe Nehemiah was trying to hide the fact that it says Yah right there. So I had to read it in Hebrew. No, it says Yah. Why, why are you not it's, nervous? Mm-hmm. Let me finish. Why are you yeah. not nervous to be able to proclaim that it is Yah here, but that you call the name Yehovah? I'm going to throw you a softball, and I'm going to give you two minutes, and I'm going to interrupt All right. you. <laughs> All right, so, so Yah is a poetic form of the name Yehovah, and uh, we actually have an example in, in uh, Deuteronomy 32 of a poetic name, the name Yeshurun, or mm-hmm. Yeshurun, which is a poetic form of the name Israel. And I think we might have talked about this in the last episode, but but um, or one of the episodes. But Yeshurun is short is the poetic form for Israel. It's actually not even abbreviated. It's it's just as long. But uh, but you know you wouldn't pronounce the name if you know let, let's in a hypothetical world if we didn't know how to pronounce the name Israel, which by the way in Hebrew is Yisrael, Yisrael. If we didn't know how to pronounce Yisrael, if we didn't have the vowels, you might think oh it's Yeshurun because of Yeshurun, you know the poetic form. But it's not. Mm-hmm. Like the poetic form doesn't teach me how to pronounce the full name. You know, I've got a nickname. I'm Nehemia, but my nickname is Hemi. So you, it doesn't mean that the full form of my name is Nehemia. It's not. It's Nehemia. Nehemia and, and Hemi. Don't, 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 or Jono, which is Jonathan. He's not Jonathan. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know or, or, or Keith, which is his nickname is <laughs> – I won't say. No, no, um, no. You're kidding me. I'm not allowed to say that. All right. So uh, – there it is, Edwin. Um, <laughs> no, 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 we'll edit that out. <laughs> no, I, I insist anyway, on listening. So that's no, what no, the no. A stands for. <laughs> Edwin. 
So maybe his full name should be Kedwin. Who knows? I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, the point is that people have nicknames all the time, and sometimes it's a poetic form of the nickname, um, and, and that doesn't tell you necessarily how to f- pronounce the full form of the nickname. And, and the form Yah, this poetic form, one of the characteristics is it's almost always at the end of a word. And what I mean by that is that the, here we have in Exodus 15.2, it says Zimrat Yah, which those two words, is the song of Yah, but really those two words are uh, essentially connected because Zimrat has something called the Smichut, the construct form, which is very common in Hebrew. But it basically Zimrat Yah, song of Yah, Yah is my song, is essentially one word. It's pronounced as one word in ancient Hebrew. And it's just like hallelujah. I mean, people know that. They know hallelujah is pronounced as one word, even though it's a compound word. It's made up of two words, which is very common in Hebrew. Um, it's praise Yah. To, it could be divided up into two words, but it's pronounced and even written sometimes as one word. Even in Hebrew, it's written as often as one word. Is hallelujah. And so Zimrat Yah. And you have Kes Yah, the throne of Yah one word. And so what we have essentially is that Yah, this poetic form, tends to appear at the end of words. So my name, Nehemiah, 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 is Yah comfort. Mm. Uh, And so Yah is at the end. You have numerous names like this. Isaiah is Yeshaya, which means Yehovah comforts. Or excuse me, sorry. Yeshaya means Yehovah saves. In fact, Yeshaya, Isaiah, is the same exact name as Joshua, Yehoshua, Mm -hmm. except one has the yud Hey vav of the name at the beginning and one has it at the end. Now, at the end, it's always Yah or Yahoo. At the beginning, it's always Yeho or uh, Yo in, in the, the abbreviated form. So, like, Jonathan is Yehonatan, which yep. is abbreviated to Yonatan. Uh, the As exact opposite of that name, Netanyahu, which is mm-hmm. also Netanya. In fact, there's a prime minister named Netanyahu, and there's a city named Netanya. So, Netanyahu, Netanya is the same exact thing. Um, and that's Yahoo, Yah, at the end. And mm-hmm. Yeho, Yo, at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, you know, so the point is that Yah isn't inconsistent with Yehovah. It's simply a poetic form that sometimes appears by itself, but usually it appears at the end of a word, and it's an abbreviation. I mean, look, think about it. It's a name like, you know, well, I love the example of Jono and Jonathan. It's obviously Jonathan, not Jonathan. Mm. And, um, but in American English, we have names like, you know, we've got a name like, you know, Dick. You know, which is short for Richard. Well, no one's going to call him Dickard, you know, Ditchard. Well, I mean, Bill, like uh, my youngest boy, his name is Bill, uh, so he's, but he's, his just, name is actually William. Wasn't that short for Billiam? I'm going to start a sect, <laughs> a whole new denomination that refers to your son as Billiam. <laughs> you can do that. Yahweh personally told me that your son's name is Billiam. <laughs> that's, a joke. that's a joke, people. <laughs> no, I'll get people who write to me all the time and they'll say, Nehemia, how can you teach that his name is Yehovah? God has personally told me that his name is Yahoo Hey, and I'm not joking. Like literally, I'll get stuff like that, and I, you know, I don't even write back to them. But my point is, like, if God has told you that personally, I didn't have that revelation. That's between you and Him. Mm. All I know is I can look at the texts and the sources and the, and the written sources. And by the way, we just came up with a really interesting series of sources that I, I wasn't aware of, and I'm revealing this now for the first time in public. And maybe I should hold this back for video, which is available for twenty nine ninety five. No. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, um, uh, all right. So look, so there's this series of sources which which confirm that the name is Yehovah, and of mm-hmm. all places to find this is in a book called the Zohar. Now you got to understand when I was first told this, I said Zohar. I don't want to touch that with a ten per- foot pole. That's Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. But uh, and the reason I don't care for Kabbalah personally is that it, it comes in t- with all kinds of weird interpretations and strange understandings. And one of the things they do in the Zohar is they give symbolic interpretations of the vowels in God's holy name, in the name yud heh vav mm-hmm. Now, those symbolic interpretations, I don't buy into that. I say that's, I, I just want to know what the words mean. I don't care about the symbolic interpretations. But the literal behind the symbolic is the vowels, Yehovah. In other words, they'll come along and say the cholam represents the crown of God. And why do they say that? Because the cholam, the O, in Yehovah is above the letters. And so they say that's the crown of God's name. All right, whatever. I'm not going to deal with the crown. I'm going to leave that for... For the, the Kabbalists to do their symbolic but, but stuff, but the point the, is, the they acknowledge the vowel. They talk about the secret of the name, and they acknowledge the vowels as Yehovah. Interesting, very interesting. <laughs> How about that? Hey, pretty cool. No, I'm. Uh, that's it. Uh, Here we go. So my... rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people, for his land and his people. So Moses came with wait 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 thirty five verse thirty five where he says, "Mine is vengeance and recompense." Come on, so it, mm. I, I got I got <laughs> come on guys Romans twelve nineteen. I'm not even a Christian. 
and I know this, where, where Paul is saying, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith mm -hmm. the Lord. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35. And what he's saying mm -hmm. is actually something really profound. In a, in, and we talk about this in a prayer to our Father, the, uh, on the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer that Keith and I wrote together, which they can get from truth number two, letter U dot org, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so so in uh, Leviticus 19, and we may have talked about this in Leviticus 19, we're commanded, lo tikom, you shall not take revenge. And then here he says, lina kam vishilem, vengeance is mine, and recompense. So, so vengeance belongs to Yehovah. We're not allowed to take revenge. Well, what does that leave us with? That leaves us with faith in the creator of the universe, that if something goes wrong, He's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Isn't that exciting? That's I'm good. excited by that. You know what? And, and there's actually a verse that talks about this where David comes before Saul and he says, look, I can't touch you. You're the Mashiach of Yehovah. You're the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Meaning he was literally anointed with oil. And he says, I dare not, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I dare not put my finger upon the Messiah of Yehovah, the anointed of Yehovah, the legitimate true king. But he says, Yehovah will judge between me and you. Mm, <laughs> David right, says true. to Saul, he's yeah. saying, there's going to be payback here, Saul. Don't worry about it. Mm. It's not going to be at my hand, but there's going to be payback because Yehovah is going to take the vengeance. And I think that's what Paul is saying. It's a perfectly good Tanakh message. He's saying, avenge not yourselves. You don't need to take revenge. Give place unto the wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will pray, saith the Lord, and quoting here Deuteronomy 32, 35. And so uh -huh. Keith already let the cat out of the bag by telling everyone that we have recorded this Torah portions before, <laughs> but it, it got lost in Cyberland and we don't know where it is. May you it's know, gone. It, but it was it we'll, wasn't it the best one we've ever done? Time. It was the we're best Torah pearls we've ever done of all Ladies time. Ladies and it gentlemen, was, I will tell you, it was amazing. It was uh, there incredible. Were three or four times where Jonah was, and I took the show over. There was and nothing like it, it in the history of Torah pearls. It was no, the I'm best Torah pearls in the history well, of all time. That's because I was in the bathroom. That's why you guys got to speak. <laughs> this is this is just a this is just a tribute to to the best Torah pearls program of all time. But if I remember correctly. Um, need to do third time. We'll see. <laughs> I think I think you even quoted right about here. You quoted Shakespeare, The Merchant I of did, Venice. I did quote Shakespeare. Do we have time for, to do that? <laughs> we, look, you, we, we're going to have to because it's the first time and probably the only time that Shakespeare is going to be quoted on Torah Pell, So you better do it. All right. And the reason I want to quote this is some, one of the things I'll hear from from uh, Christians a lot, and not from everyone, but I'll hear from some Christians, and they'll say, you know, the, you're, you got you Jews have the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of vengeance. And uh, our God is the God of love, you know, the God of forgiveness. And, and we just saw that, according to Paul, that actually the God of the New Testament is also a God of vengeance when it's appropriate, mm. when there's been someone has been wronged and they allow for God's wrath and, uh, and the person hasn't repented that, you know, vengeance is mine. He will, he will take that vengeance both in the Old and the New Testament. But what I love is um, in the Merchant of Venice – there's this scene that, that many Christians get this as, you know, uh, this is, this is the, t the, the stereotypical Jew for them. The Merchants of Venice is one of Shakespeare's plays, and it's about this uh, Jewish moneylender who owes uh, – who, excuse me, who lends money to the Christian merchant. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and, he's, and, he, and the guy doesn't have collateral, so he takes his collateral a pound of flesh. And when, you know, he originally says this, the guy thinks that's a joke, you know, a pound of flesh. I'm not going to give you a pound of flesh. That would kill me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and anyway, he, you know, the, the Christian thought, well, this is a, this is a sure thing. I've got nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an Acts three, or excuse me, Acts. This is in Merchant of Venice, Act three, <laughs> scene one. And uh, and what's happening here is this guy. He sent out a boat using the money he borrowed from the Jewish moneylender. And by the way, for those who don't know, Jews were required to be moneylenders. They, mm -hmm. they, there were some countries. And the reason was that the Christian doctrine said you're not allowed to lend money from one Christian to another. And so they actually required the Jews to lend out the money. Mm. And the Jews didn't want to do this. They wanted to farm and milk cows. Like Tevye in, in the Fiddlers, you know, in the uh, – in Yeah, the, Fiddler on the Roof. Wanted to milk cows. But in some countries, in some places, the Jews were required to be moneylenders. And, and part of the advantage was they would make all this money. And then if the Christian king couldn't pay it back, he just came and stole it from the Jews or killed mm. them. And so here we have a scene where uh, Shylock, the Jewish money uh, lender, comes to uh, – and he says, OK, you haven't paid the debt. I want my pound of flesh. The pound of flesh. I need to get my pound of flesh. And, and the guy says to him, why am, uh, why am I sure if you forfeit, thou wilt, take his, not, thou wilt not take his flesh? What's that good for? In other words, a pound of flesh? What are you going to do with that? That's no, no value to you. And then Shylock says, to bait fish with all, if it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. In other words, I'll use this pound of fish as a fish bait if I want. Right, but yeah. the bottom line is this will feed my revenge. Mm -hmm. And he goes on and he says, he has disgraced me. 
and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, meaning he made fun of Jews. He thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded my enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Has, and then this is one of the most famous passages in, in all of literature, mm. where Shylock then says, has, a, has not a Jew eyes? In other words, you're treating me so horribly like I'm not even a human being. And he says, has not a Jew eyes, has not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as the Christian is. In other words, mm. we're human just like you are. If you prick us, do we not bleed? Mm. If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If, you are li- if we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. In other words, he's saying, mm. uh, you guys take revenge, and we're, we're human just like you. Uh, he says, if a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. Mm. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me I will execute, and I shall go hard but I will better the instruction. What he's saying here in, in this fancy old English is, uh, hey, I learned revenge from you Christians. You, you talk about forgiveness, but I've been watching you, and I see that you, you're the masters of revenge, mm. and I'm going to learn from your lesson and better you at it. <laughs> so this is this image that Christians have of Jews that, you know, there's this, the, the God of the Old Testament is the God of vengeance. And look, the Jews love taking revenge. But if you actually read what Shakespeare says, this is, and look, for better or for worse, this is the image many people have of Jews. They read this in high schools, or at least they used to, um, in the U.S., and uh, they think, oh, the Jews are all about revenge. They want the poor man's pound of flesh, and he's going to die from you know, cutting out a pound of his flesh. But <laughs> what's Shakespeare's point? The point is Jews are humans, and one of, the, one of the things humans want to do is take revenge. And that's what the Torah is coming to teach us. You know, um, There's this statement earlier in, in, in Genesis, it appears twice, where it says the thoughts of, uh, uh, of man's uh, heart are evil from his youth. Mm. And, uh, and this is what Yehovah says. He says, okay... This human being I created, he's thought, he's scheming and he's planning and he's looking to do evil from the day he's born until the day he dies. I'm going to come and teach him how to be a decent human being. And the way he teaches us is through his teaching. The Hebrew word for teaching is Torah. He's given us the Torah. Mm-hmm. The Torah tells us, Lotikom, Leviticus 19, you shall not take revenge. And it says, kamocha, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And no one would want themselves to have a, a pound of flesh to be cut out. And, mm-hmm. and you know, we, we, want, we want to be forgiven by other people when we screw up. Mm-hmm. And the point is we need to do that to others. We need to not take revenge and leave that to Yehovah. He will Amen. settle the matter. There will be justice. And that's why I'm reading Shakespeare, because here's the stereotypical image of the Jew. And what the Jew is really saying is, hey, I learned from the best how to take revenge. I learned it from the Christians. And uh, we both need to learn from the creator of the universe, just like Paul did, from Moses, who wrote the words of the creator of the universe in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 32, teaching us not to take revenge, but to leave that to Mm -hmm. the Father of creation. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, Keith, you mentioned before, of course, the book is Hallowed Name Revealed Again. Brilliant book. Um, Another one that is a must-have on the bookshelf. And, of course, the bonus chapter, which you mentioned, What About the Name Jesus? The next verse so Moses came with, now I've got Joshua, uh, the son of Nun, but it's not Joshua, is it? Well, actually, it depends on what uh, translation you read. Some will say Hosea. Truly. Well, in, in what, does it, what does it say in the Hebrew? That's a great question. Let's open up the Hebrew and see what it says. It says Hosea bin Nun. I Hosea bet it does say Hosea. But is it, is it Hosea, is it Hosea in, in the NIV? Uh, I've got a note in the NIV that says Hosea. Mm-hmm. Where did we did it? We went over that in Numbers. You remember where the first, uh, the first time that anyone uh, had a um, where, where where Moses actually renamed someone. We have it with this man named Hosea. Mm. And what did Moses do? He said, "Your name shall no longer be Hosea. Now I shall call you Yehoshua." And what is that, Jono? Well, Yehoshua is, is Yehovah saves. Hosea is he he saves. Is that correct? So I remember boy, that correctly. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, we're getting really close. So, so, and so, what's happening in the NIV? They're saying we don't want to confuse them too much. We just want to remind them it's Joshua, but we're supposed to be reminded that it's Hosea in the Hebrew. Hosea was the first man that was ever re- given a new name using the name Yehovah connected. I think if we look in the Bible, we'll find that Moses is the first man to do that. Joshua was the first man to have that happen to him, and so as a result, that name is the name that was given. We're reminded of his other name, and then what happens with this name later? We find that even this name becomes Yeshua, son of Nun. And I think mm. that's in, is that in Ezra? Or is, that, is that in? Um, it's Nehemiah 8.17. It says, um, 
Can I read it real quick in Hebrew? Vayasu kol kahala shavim and ashavi Sukkot. And all the congregation who returned from the captivity did su- uh, made Sukkot. Vayishvu ba Sukkot. And they uh, dwelt in the Sukkot. Ki lo asumi me Yeshua bin Nun ken b'nei Yisrael adayom hu. For Israel had not done, uh, the sons of Israel had not done uh, like that uh, since the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun. Hmm. Uh, in other words, they hadn't made so many Sukkot, hadn't been kept so widely. And he's called mm-hmm. there Yeshua bin Nun, Yeshua the son of Nun. And Yeshua and Yehoshua is the same name. Now, now I, I'm a little confused by everything you said here, Keith, because you said that, that the original name of this man who's called Yehoshua or Yeshua, the son of Nun, Moses' faithful disciple, that originally he was called Hosea. Mm-hmm. But shouldn't his name, if we add the Yud, then be Yehoshea? <laughs> no, yes, look, if it's Yah, and then we add the, the Vav Hey, it's Yahweh. So if we add the Yud to Hosea, it should be Yehoshea, shouldn't it? Yeah, well, and don't it we have be. a prophet in the Bible named Hosea, which is really Hosea? I think yes. we're going to – maybe we should start calling him Hoshua. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. We've got the book of Hosea. It should be Hosua instead of Hosea okay. because Yehoshua <laughs> – isn't that the logic of Hebrew? That's the, logic. the logic of Hebrew. That's the logic I think that's actually the logic of people who don't know Hebrew, who know who just don't know Hebrew themselves exactly. and others. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the, the next word says, Moses, Moses finished speaking all these words. Can you imagine if it was Nehemiah? That'd be there until the... No, 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 no. It, never finish. Yeah. <laughs> Look, the book of Deuteronomy would have been the size of the writings of Shakespeare. <laughs> Moses finished speaking all these words to Israel, and he, Wherefore art thou, Romeo? And he said to them, "Set your heart on all the words which I testify among you today, which you, which you, you, you command your children, and be careful to observe all the words of this Torah, for it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess." There it is. Mm-hmm. Then Yehovah spoke to Moses on the very same day, saying, "Go up to the mountain of." Uh, Mountain of Avarim. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, view the land of Canaan, which I will give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mm-hmm. mountain, which you will ascend, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. Because you trespassed, Keith, this is what it says, mm-hmm. because you trespassed against me among the children right. of Israel at the waters of Meribah. Regardless of what people understand and what you've heard from others, maybe on the internet or on radio shows, the reason that Moses did not cross over is because he trespassed. He trespassed. There's no other confusion. You may have heard something from other, some other maybe Muslim so sites sorry. or something like that. <laughs> the bottom line is... This what are you is talking about? Go, go ahead. <laughs> So in, the, ahead, in the wilderness of sin, because you did not allow me, to, you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel, yes. yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there, into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. And that concludes chapter yes. 32, which is our Torah portion. My goodness. So um, awesome. That's awesome. Well, that was that was good, you guys. That was excellent. Folks, you thanks know, for listening to our rant. We've only got one more Torah pros that are left. Now this is unless we have to do this one a third time. <laughs> oh. We've only got we've only got third one left. There is, there is there is controversy. Uh, the, some people are writing in and saying the only way that they'll they'll listen if we go forward is if we even it out and it's 50, um, uh, 33, 33, and thirty three as far as the time that we used to speak. So if we can get to the thirty three each, then there will be another Torah pro. <laughs> I've got one more thing to say. Just checking, and I've got the file. You've got the you've got the file. It's 134 megabytes, and let me just see if it's. um, Hang on, don't stop recording. I'm adding something to it. Oh, I stopped recording. Should I record again? No, don't worry about it. This is all I have to say, (laughs) and that is, Father, open our eyes that we may see wondrous hidden things in your Torah. Amen. Amen. There it is. And so you've been listening to Torah Pearls. Uh, this was, again, as we mentioned, a tribute to the greatest Torah Pearls that was in the history of the world that was lost in cyberspace, and so we did it again. The second last one for the year on truth to youorg truth number 2 letter U.org, where you can also freely download this and other Torah Pearls programs at truth to youorg that were actually recorded and remained on the recording. And so <laughs> next week, oh, next week we are in... Is that right? This is the blessing. There it is. You know, you say that first one was lost, but Yehovah heard that one, and we did that for him. This one we did for people.